There we go. Big in. Well, no doubt about it. Every trip to Toledo Bend is a memorable one. It's a legendary place. This is why 2016, last year, is remembered. Somebody poked the bear after a few years vacation from winning. Kevin Van Dam coming back, really starting a fire. Three tournaments won in 2016, starting right here at Toledo Bend. You're watching the Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend, being brought to you live by PowerPole. Let's get to it. Sun barely peeking over the horizon, trying to become daylight here at Toledo Bend Reservoir. That was early this morning. Boats putting in that giant ramp down there. Cypress Bend, a legendary place, iconic place in the sport of professional bass fishing, all wheeled around this giant lake, Toledo Bend Reservoir. Legendary because there's so much history here. How about some history making stuff from that guy last year? Kevin Van Dam winning his first of three tournaments in 2016. All these guys putting in Big Fish Bobby Lane. Well, Big Fish is what lives here at Toledo Bend, so that's an appropriate shot right there, Davey I. It certainly is. Looking at Kevin Van Dam, Bobby Lane, guys that, that are the best in the world, own the best fishery in the world, voted by Bassmaster Magazine the last two years running. A lot of people were saying, ah, oh, it's tough, it's tough. For some reason, these guys tend to say that during practice, but yesterday showed Toledo Bend will produce a lot of big fish again this year. Absolutely, we'll get a look at that leaderboard a little bit later on and get the particulars for you right there. There's your leader on this tournament after one day of fishing who already has under his belt a win this year at Cherokee Lake to start Bassmaster Elite Series season. Second place, Brett Hyde right there. Anytime we see it up, there's gonna be a day or two when this guy is just beating everyone's brains out. Sometimes he does it for a whole tournament. He does, he seems to do really well. When we go to fisheries that have vegetation, have hydrilla, not as much there at Toledo Bend this year as there has been in the past. Those things go through cycles depending on the rain, the, the water color, all those sort of things that the grass kind of comes and goes, but there's enough grass there at Toledo Bend this year for Brett Hyde to do well. All right, let's take a look at what went down at the weigh-in yesterday at Cypress Bend Park. Jacob Wheeler, young man who already, as we say, owns a victory this, th thus far this season on top of 25 pounds plus, the only guy over 25. Brett Hyde, like Jamie Hartman, another one of the overachievers from Cherokee Lake up there, showing up again. This guy, uh, what a story. We'll talk about him as well. Jason Christie, second place right now in Toyota Bassmaster Angler of the Year points, and Steve Kennedy, who knocked him out two weeks ago. Hey, hey Davey, you know, I mean, we talk about, uh, you know, we, we maybe got the post-crisis, uh, I mean, the post-classic blues. <laughs> this is a way to get per perked back up again. It, it a little trip to Toledo Bend. It really is. Toledo Bend is such a great fishery. Through the years that I fished, 23 years, in fact, went to Toledo Bend multiple times. It's just a great fishery. We love it so much because of the big fish, obviously, but it's a big lake, and you always love to go fish tournaments on big lakes. You have enough room to spread around, have a lot of different things going on, a lot of different patterns. I think this week we'll see a lot of sight fishing, okay. probably more of that than anything else, but then also some offshore fishing I definitely think will come into play later in the week. And this morning, guys are really focusing on a shad spawn. We'll have a little bit of that in the mornings, especially the first two hours. Well, last year we had offshore and shad spawn. We're all looking forward to seeing how big that plays this time around. We're going to have a fun day today. Of course, a, a big component of that, too. I've been sitting right there. Our pals, the Such, Mike Sukon, Bassmaster.com. What are you looking at today, Such? Oh, we're looking at the weather. Guys aren't bundled up as much as they were yesterday because the wind. It's about the same temperature, mid-40s, but the wind is only uh, five miles an hour tops today. So it's going to be a lot nicer and it may help some guys fishing as well. Good point right there. And Ron Moore, Ronnie, I know. I know what you've been looking at. Everybody's talking about you know, all the chatter that goes on before a tournament. Oh, Toledo Bend's going to be so tough this year. I think you may have, I want to tip your hand, but you're, you're going to explore those numbers a little bit. Well, that's the thing, Tommy. Everybody always wants to write stories about overfishing, Toledo Bend, Gunnersville, things like that. But we've seen how Toledo produces, and it produced yesterday as well. So we expect it to, to continue the rest of the week. 
All right. Well, let's take a look at Toledo, Ben. I mean, that's clearly one of the stars of our show and is going to be every day here on Bassmaster Live. And Davey, a giant 180. I mean, this is Kentucky Lake size stuff, the biggest man-made body of water in Texas. It is, and legendary. There's yeah. been tournaments there. I remember as a teenager reading about Toledo Bend, Larry Nixon, Harold Allen, Tommy Martin, guys that are iconic in this sport. And Toledo Bend has always been a big player in our sport ever since we've been tournament fishing. Yeah, those guys who, who cut their teeth as guides down there just learned how to fish in every possible way. It's such a great laboratory for bass fishing. It's just like Gunnerville, a place that just keeps putting out the big ones and you catch them so many different ways. 65 miles long, so big contrast to Conroe uh, two <laughs> weeks ago. When it's only 20 miles long, a guy could go run up the top, down to the bottom, multiple times a day. You ain't going to do that here. You're not going to. And one thing to keep in mind, the winds really blew hard in practice. I don't think we're going to see that during the tournament, but it kept a lot of guys from being able to cover water and practice as, as efficiently as they may have wanted to, because it's really hard to maneuver Toledo Bend if the wind's blowing out of north or south, coming straight up and down this big reservoir. But the calm winds, there'll be guys that I think move up the leaderboard as they learn more and more about what these fish are doing as the tournament progresses. All of this situated on the famous Sabine River, which uh, flows out of Texas and northern Louisiana and forms the border between Texas, East Texas, and northwestern Louisiana, flowing all the way down out of here, down to Sabine Lake and distributing into the Gulf of Mexico. Let's take a look, show you just exactly what part of that border we're on there, about halfway down the state, maybe a little north of Alexandria, south of Shreveport. Uh, this is bass fishing country. I mean, this is this is where the culture is strong. It is. A lot of these guys just moved not very far away from Lake Conroe and just stayed the week here at Toledo Bend. Some of them went and pre-fished Sam Rayburn. Uh, like you say, the heart of bass fishing for sure. All right, now now let's talk about what, I mean, it's such a long lake, 65 miles. It may be different stages at, at either end, right, Davey? That's a good point. The north end, is shallower, typically has more water color, and it warms up quicker. That north end could be a player this, this year more than it has the last few times we've been down there. The population of fish up on this north end seemed to, to dwindle in the last five or six years, but, but when that happens, fishing pressure lessens and the population rejuvenates itself. Yep. And I think this year it might be a player more than it has in the past. All right, that little white line is actually the border between Texas and Louisiana. We're gonna do our best. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. It is a remote place. It is not an urban area like Houston, Texas. So getting signal is, is gonna be a precious thing to us here. But let's take a look at our raffle of four live. The anglers we are covering today, starting with Jason Christie. Yeah, and Jason Christie, you expect him to be there. Every time we're around big fish, Jason Christie is a big fish guy and he caught the big fish yesterday, almost a 10 pounder. He said he didn't expect to catch a 10 pounder. Who does? Even Jason Christie is somewhat of a pleasant surprise. Hey, a surprise to all of us. We got to meet this guy for the first time, really. Uh, Jamie Hartman from the Lake Oneida area, Newport, New York right there, who knocked him dead on Cherokee Lake and, and really took that thing right down to the wire. You expected to see him do well there because he had a drop shot. He does that a lot at home, but at Toledo Bend, it's impressive. That's absolutely, and here's a guy who's impressive. As we say, just about every time we tee it up, he's gonna be menacing the, the field for a day or two, and sometimes all four days. Brett Hyde lives for places with shallow vegetation. You know he's gonna have a chatterbait in his hand, and he's almost always up close to the top of the leaderboard. Seems to show up everywhere we go, no matter where it is, prepared and ready to knock him dead. He's always, always ready to do it. And how about our leader, Jacob Wheeler? You talk about, about a guy that's ready for 2016. That's the man right there. Yeah, speaking of always seems to show up, this guy is on fire this year, and we expect to see good things for him for the next three days. All right, that's a raffle of four live. We're doing our best to bring you pictures from them from the somewhat remote Toledo Camp Lake all day long. If you can bear with us, we're going to try to do it. And we got a good picture. Good to know we got a good picture of our own Dave Mercer right there. He there. Is. Hey, got some reports from him during yesterday, day one. Dave out there, we just looked at our Arapala, our top four guys there. Dave, this is, this is an all-star lineup here and, and a few surprises maybe to you. I, it is, well, the biggest surprise is, is Jacob Wheeler, really. I mean, at this point, I, I think, you know, just when you think Jordan Lee is the hottest young superstar in the world, Jacob Wheeler comes back to the Elite Series and reminds everybody what he is up to. I mean, what he... I mean, I know we are just one day into this event. We're a quarter way into the event. But what he is doing here, I mean, if he can hold this together, he's fished three elites. I know I'm not breaking any news here, but he's fished three elite series events. He has won two of them, and now he's in his fourth, and he's leading that. I mean, this is unheard of territory. And, you know, 
I mean, it's that's the most shocking thing. Other than that, I mean, you look at the weights, and me and Stevie Wright were talking this morning. The whole way through weighing, it just kind of let me know what time of year we're here. You could totally tell the way those weights are off. I mean, I think KVD had 29 pounds the last time we were here on day one. We had a couple of 25-pound bags. And if you look, those weights are off, you know, two to three pounds. And that's just telling me that, you know, these fish are not, you know, munching yet. There's a lot of post-spawn fish and a lot of stressed out fish from spawning. Um, but the weights, I mean, Toledo Bend shows up every time we're here. I mean, numbers wise, they actually caught more fish yesterday than they did this day in the tournament last year. So it, Toledo Bend is, is a phenomenal, phenomenal fishery. I mean, the one thing I will never listen to again is if I go to a pre-tournament meeting and these guys start telling me that uh, I, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm going to catch a fish. I mean, that just lies. They you tell know, you that every bend. time, Dave. They've been doing that to you thing, for five years now. <laughs> and, yeah, and all the time, and the amazing thing is just the numbers. I talked to uh, our host here, and she was telling me generally by this time of year, this lake will have had. 35 tournaments, 35 big tournaments. They have had 135 to this point this year. And we're not talking about for everybody listening at home. You know, you think of a tournament, you think, ooh, a big tournament's like 100 boats. We're talking about, you know, Sealy's Big Bass event has 3,000 boats. Uh, they, she named like five or six different tournaments that have over 1,500 boats. So this lake just gets so much pressure, but it continues to punt out. It's an anomaly. This lake and Gunnersville, lakes like that, they get pressure 365 days a year and never let us down. Dave, I got a quick question for you. You got to see those fish up close yesterday. Did a lot of those fish look like they were still pre-spawn? A lot of them looked really stressed. I mean, if you look at Wheeler's fish, I mean, there's some there's some pictures there. I mean, you see those tails. I mean, half of them, half of those fish don't have tails. So um, I, there was some pre-spawn fish, but I, for general, they look skinny. You know, you know when you go to a lake and it's kind of that middle transition. I think that's what we're seeing too, Davey. I mean, you talk to guys, and and this is something we'll always say here in Toledo Bend. You'll hear people say things like, you can catch them any way you want, but even more so this time. I mean, you've got guys who are fishing right on the bank. You've got guys who are offshore. And one of the interesting facts that several anglers told me is they said as this tournament progresses, some of them are banking on that offshore bite a bit because they feel that the fish, you know, there's maybe 30% of the fish left on the bank, you know, and a lot of those are the buck bass, the smaller ones. But they were telling me the cool thing about that is having that option allows you to commit to that offshore bite more. Knowing that you can go up to the shoreline, and literally I've had anglers explain it to me that you can almost go to any shoreline, put your trolling motor down, and you're going to find bedding fish. They're not the ones you want to weigh in, but knowing that that option's out there and knowing you can put a quick limit together allows you to commit to other ways to catch those big fish. So I really think this tournament, if you look at the leaderboard, it's going to be a lot of moving. It's very similar to a northern event where it's so tight around that cut line um, and also like a Florida event because it was all about the big bite. If you look at how many guys weighed in, you know, with 18 pounds but had a seven to eight pounder, you know, you replace that with a two pounder and it's a whole different world. So I think you're going to see a lot of movement in our leaderboard today. Turnover at the top. We always expect that on day number two. Dave, I want to switch subjects with you just a little bit. I mean, Jacob Wheeler on top again. You know, we've, this has been the year of the 20-something. I know you're just a few weeks re removed from being a 20-something yourself, but I mean, <laughs> what do you think this, this tw whole 20-something thing does? Is, is it good for the sport of bass fishing? you got to think it is, right? Did you just it's incredible, and, and I'm going to do it right here on live. I hope my I hope my mic will pick this up, but I have decided this needs to be Jacob Wheeler's new way in song. And if the crew maybe can get this funneled in, uh, I, hopefully you can hear this. But this is this explains what Jacob Wheeler is doing. Just just bear with me, guys. Here we go. <laughs> I mean, that explains his season. I mean, that is my ringtone for Jacob Wheeler when he calls me. And, and I really believe he is five bass away from having people throw rose petals as he walks across the stage. I mean, it is glorious. It is glorious. It, it's good stuff. That, but the 20 something's day, I mean, they are coming to the forefront in 2016. And, and uh, did you see it coming yourself? Uh, it's amazing. I mean, we've all talked about the incredible crop of young anglers we have. But you look at Wheeler. 
Ott, um, obviously, uh, J uh, Lee, uh, just that, you know, you can keep going. Justin Lucas, I'll tell you one of the things right now, one of the scariest people to be right now is those young 20-year-old guys that were at the Classic, you know, those Carhartt College Bass guys that want to follow in uh, Jordan Lee's footsteps. Boy, you're going to have to hurdle over some hammers for the next 20 years of your life if you're going to make it on the Elite Series. Like, you know, you look at these guys, they come in more prepared. They come in, uh, they do more research. It's amazing. I mean, it's, and it, it's no different than other sports, really. I mean, you talk to different guys who, you know, I've had several friends who play hockey, and they'll tell me, you know, I had friends who played hockey as little as 15 years ago, and they used to say, we'd go to training camp to get in shape. And now the kids show up in every sport, in shape, ready, because the, you know, you've got such a small window to make it. Years ago, you'd see somebody hang around for five, six years. If they don't make it in the first three years, generally you don't see them again. They, they disappear. So these people come in prepared and, and the last thing in the world I would like to be, I mean, every once in a while, somebody will send me an email and say, don't you miss fishing tournaments? Not when you look at these guys. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's Davey. Good choice, let me just say. <laughs> Welcome to the broadcast team. A perfect time to slide on out of that lineup of assassins. Yeah, that's right. Seek a little shelter. Dave Mercer, thank you so much. We'll be leaning on you plenty uh, during the course of the day today. Uh, let's, go to, let's go to the way in and, and, Thanks, and, and a little bit of an interview we did earlier today with the guy who caught the big one, uh, uh, Jason Christie, second place right now in Toyota Bassmaster Angler of the Year points. I hope they can hear that. Could you hear that? Getting ready to start day two here at Toledo, man. You know, sitting in fourth place, had 21 and some change. Got lucky and caught a big one yesterday, you know, almost a 10-pounder. And that, you just can't predict a, a bite like that. You know, my practice wasn't that good. All I'm really doing is running the bank and, and checking these fish that are pulling up to spawn and, you know, just covering lots and lots of water. And you really just don't know when you're going to get that next bite. And that's kind of scary, you know. I was fortunate yesterday to catch that big one early. And, you know, I kind of settled down and, and just went fishing the rest of the day. but. You know, today we're going to move around quite a bit, you know, just hit a lot of little key areas. I, I know in my mind what I'm looking for, but I don't know the, the lake well enough, so I have to go in areas, kind of look a little bit, and just keep moving. Uh, not going to spend a lot of time at one spot, so hopefully we, you know, not looking for that 10-pounder today. I'd, I'd like to have one, but just looking for, you know, a solid 15 pounds, and, and I'd be a happy guy. Yeah, you know, it was a good day. I, I really... Uh had kind of a tough practice. First day of practice was really good and uh, last two days were real tough. So uh, I had a few areas and just went in those areas and obviously got a couple of those key bites that you need here to lead a bend uh, to be up in the leaderboard. You know, trying to break that 20 pound mark is really the goal here this week each day. Um, but I think to do that, you got to have a couple of those key bites and things just went right. Uh, you know, I got a lemon early and kind of settled down then caught a big one and then kind of figured out something later in the afternoon where I caught a couple big ones. So looking forward to today. Um, I know there's a lot of big ones where I'm fishing and, you know, just saying go out there and uh, have fun, go fishing, and uh, hopefully get a couple of those key bites. Second and third place, Brett Height and, and uh, second and, and fifth place, Brett Height and Jason Christie right there. Take a look at some of our some of our past winners here. Hey, Dean Dean Rojas loves this place. He does, and obviously that was a sight fishing tournament. He caught him, caught fish a few different ways, but it was a shootout between him and Gerald Swindle. Gerald throwing a jerk bait. Dean sight fishing. I think we'll see both of those this week. Yeah, one ounce that victory over I Gerald like Swindle. That. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> welcome to the Gun Show with Dean Rojas right there. Used his little little brim bait to get started every day, and then then sack the big ones later. Brent Chapman, not too far, just around the corner from the way, and I wonder if he's checked that spot kept it honest here this time that's how he won in 2012. In 2012 there was a lot of grass at Toledo Bend that's one reason that I think the fishing got so good a few years after that don't think it'll be as much of that going on flipping grass there's just not a lot of it this year. And Chapman won that one on his way to becoming Toyota Bassmaster Angler of the Year in 2012 certainly a highlight for his career and something he's looking to do one more time Jacob Perosnik doing something different yet again. He is but side fishing Dean Rojas, that was part of his arsenal when he won there, and Jason Prosnick, he caught basically all of his fish to win this tournament. This year is going to shape up a lot like 2014. The winds are supposed to be calm, and, and a lot of fish will be up on the bank spawning. You heard Mike Sukon say it. The wind's going to be much, uh, much more laid down today than it was last time around. Maybe Jacob Prosnick. Uh, 
just licking his chops a little bit over a prospect like that. And then we go to last year, Kevin Van Dam, classic Van Dam. Boy, I could talk for <laughs> the rest of life about Kevin Van Dam. I was fortunate enough to room with him for 12 years. Uh, he's a great friend, obviously a great fisherman. Everyone in the country knows that. Kevin Van Dam, like you mentioned, somebody poked the bear oh, yeah. about this time last year. He won three events. Getting that shad spawn thing going early in the morning, just getting set up for, for going out, get backing off a little bit and just absolutely going to work with that crankbait. That was a, it was a thing to watch, a thing of beauty and classic Van Dam. That was a, the start of an incredible season last year for him. We can't stress that enough. Let's take a look at here at a little bit as we move up to Lita Bend. Jamie Hartman on lower and back in a creek. It really surprised me. This guy is obviously more versatile than we thought, or certainly more than I thought, because he dropped shot it at Cherokee Lake, had a second place finish. Everybody expected to see him do well there, but maybe not on a place like this. And with the rain they had earlier this week, that's probably back in dirty water. Brett Height said he found something a little later in the day. What, what's your best guess as to what that was? I'm gonna, I'm gonna guess that he found a little deeper grass and uses chatterbait to catch a lot of his yeah. fish. He wouldn't even tell me last night when I talked to him, but he's got a bait that he thinks he's using that other guys don't have. Not the bladed jig? Not the bladed okay. jig. Okay, okay. That would be interesting. Can't wait to see that. I want to get some pictures of him. Jacob Wheeler, we saw him working not too far from the launch just minutes ago. I wish he'd have stayed there. We could have kept yeah. watching that. <laughs> yep, I knew we weren't going to stay there long to start catching some because it's real important this week. We mentioned it during the Classic, but equally so here. The shad spawn is going on and it's so, so important to be able to put some fish in a live well early, settle down and fish offshore. I think the guys that, that really will be at the top of the leaderboard will be doing that. And uh, top off our raffle of four live. The guys we're covering today, Jason Christie. Now you say he had that, that nine plus fish yesterday and said that, that means he's gonna fall on day number two. The guy who won the, who led the classic two days did not fall a, after catching a nine and three quarter pounder. No, he uh, didn't. Jason Christie is one of those guys that he just kind of wants to be out of the spotlight until on Sunday. He does a good job of just being nonchalant about what he's on. But when you see him come out of the gate catching a big fish like that and having the string that he had yesterday, I'll bet we'll see him on Sunday fishing. All right, that was Brent Ayler we're talking about at the Bassmaster Classic last week. But what the, st the story, another one of these 20-somethings here, Jordan <laughs> Lee. I'm gonna give you a little taste of what you'll see. We, we've got our full shore, our five hours of programming, uh, The really the highlights, the, the, the unseen things from the Bassmaster Classic coming up next weekend, Saturday, April 15th from 7 to 10 a.m. You'll see all five hours, you'll see all the show shows over the course of the weekend, including Sunday from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. And Jordan Lee just absolutely, the final day is, is staggering. You know, watch. we covered that tournament live as we always do, but we saw some footage when we were doing these shows for ESPN that just was so impressive. Jordan Lee was acting like a veteran. He had some mechanical issues in the morning that in my opinion, turned out to be the best blessing he ever had mm. because it forced him to stay close, make a decision whether he would stay close, try to go change boats. There was a lot of things going on and he handled it to perfection. Stayed on the one place that he said he saw a school of five pounders the day before late in the day and because of the mechanical issues, I think he stayed there where he may not have had he not had those issues, turned out to be the best thing could have happened to him, and he put on a clinic with a mop jig. Absolutely did on that final day there. Lake Conroe was a great place to find the best bass angler in the world because it absolutely gave one day of torture to everyone who was trying to win that thing. Every single person, I'm talking about veterans, the, the reigning Bass Master Classic champion, Edwin Evers, he, he was catching 15 to 20 pounds so easy in the mornings, and in the third morning, it was like everything went around. Again, that's coming up next weekend, Saturday and Sunday. ESPN2, the full story of the Bassmaster, the Geico Bassmaster Classic there, 7 to 10 on Saturday. That's Eastern Time and 10 a.m. to 12 Eastern Time on Sunday. Boy, you will get to see it all. There's plenty, plenty that you didn't get to see on Bassmaster Live. Especially a lot of this right here. He did a lot of it on the final day. And one of those that we'll be sort of dissecting for years to come what happened there. Lake Conroe confounding everyone and then someone who, who can't move, who is tied down to a place, yeah. winds up winning it. Here we go, mm. Jacob Wheeler. Speaking of the Lee brothers. Yeah, that is not Jordan Lee in fifth place right there. We watched this yesterday and him ringing him up there, yeah. Ronnie, uh, on, on, on the, on the uh, bass track. He had a giant as well yesterday, an eight plus pounder, yeah, maybe nine stupid. pounder. So he had a giant to go with his bag as well. 
I love watching Jacob Wheeler throw this buzz bait. Of all the baits that I've threw in my career, tournament fishing, the buzz bait was the most fun. I didn't win a lot of money on a buzz bait because one day you'll catch them on it and the next day they just won't bite it. They'll roll at it and all that sort of thing. But it is just a fun bait to throw because you know any cast you could catch a, a nine or 10 pounder, especially when you're on a place like Toledo Bend. What is the perfect buzz bait day to you, Davey? Perfect what buzz bait day is, is low pressure, a few clouds, light winds. The, the thing that might be hurting it here today is the Make higher pressure. It's a co cooler morning. Behind this guy. Let's listen. Talking about the weather today, that's going to be a big factor. We talk about that leaderboard turning over. Will the weather play a part as we take a look at our TH Marine weather watch today? Boy, just perfect temperatures. Starting out a little chilly this morning, but climbing all, uh, all the way up past 72 degrees, sunny all day long. Look at that wind, only four miles an hour. We get warmer and warmer as we go through the weekend, and we get a little bit windier and windier as we, we go through the weekend. We do. Today and tomorrow, I totally expect us to see some really big fish being caught off the bed. It'll be interesting to watch these guys fish for sight fish. Sometimes you think, well, that's boring because they're just it. But the different baits they'll use and the different methods, there's so much to learn about sight fishing that the, from these guys that are definitely the best in the business. About, about 30 fish caught right now, Casey actually has the biggest one, about four and a half pounds. Adrian Avina with the first limit of the day, nine pounds or so, just a small limit, but he could be one of those guys catching some shad spawn fish, catching quantity instead of quality so far this morning. All right, we uh, alluded to it a little bit earlier. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. This, uh, the, 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 the piney woods of East Texas and Northwest Louisiana are remote places. These are not big city places. These are country places out in the country here at Toledo Bend. And we're just, we just we're thankful for every drop of signal we can get from this lake. And that's what we're waiting on right now. Some pictures of some anglers to come in. And then, you know, eventually someone's going to move into a spot. I hope not eventually. I hope soon. Yeah. We so hope we can see some fishing. We hope soon. Talked about it a little yesterday. In my opinion, the two things that has helped our sport grow more than ever is the Carhartt College Championship, the high school anglers and the college anglers, and that is absolutely the reason we're seeing these 20-year-olds make, make these moves on the Elite yeah, Series. Yeah. The other thing is the live coverage, but a great lake like Toledo Bend is usually these good, good fisheries are in remote locations and it's hard to have the sales service to cover these guys live but we we'll certainly do yeah, it's a it's a technology that utilizes uh, multiple cell towers to sort of split up that that heavy uh, heavy data signal and then reassemble it back here to us and we get these live pictures something we weren't able to do four years ago it's it's a dream come true for for everyone who wanted to be able to you know someday cover a fishing tournament like a golf tournament we're not quite there yet obviously uh, obviously we're gonna we're gonna get there yep so tell us about some of the catches. Well, one thing that was interesting, we, we talked about it before the show started. Day one yesterday, we saw four Texans, guys that we expected to do well in the Classic, that didn't do so well. We had four of them in the top 16, Todd Faircloth coming in in sixth, Alton Jones in 10th, Keith Combs in 13th, and Takahiro Omori in 16th. So we have four Texans who were supposed to be Conroe favorites, didn't do it so hot because it was so inconsistent using that local knowledge and experience at Toledo Bend this week, and they're right in contention in the top 20. And that's four Texans that have won on the Bassmaster Elite oh, well, Tournament absolutely. Trail before, and you yeah. certainly expect to see them do well here at Toledo Bend. Classic sprinkled, sprinkled in there as well. Overall, Ronnie? So, <laughs> overall, the fishing, the size of the fish, Dave Mercer mentioned it, the post-spawn fish, fish weighing a little bit less. We saw that with the cut lines um, from day one. We also saw that with the average of fish. Average fish on day one of 2016, three pounds. That was uh, Steve Wright blogged that yesterday. The average fish caught on day one was three pounds last year. This year, the average weight of a fish is 2.8 pounds, so roughly a two and three quarter pounder. So, you know, a little bit smaller on average, but we saw at least two fish break Kevin Van Dam's big fish. You know, we had two nine pounders roughly, a nine ten by Jason Christie, probably a nine pounder by Matt Lee, and then, you know, we saw Shaw Grigsby with an eight something that could have weighed even more because it spit up a giant gizzard shed in its live well. So we've seen some really big fish, but I think there are a lot of smaller fish because of that post spawn conditions.
Spit up a what? A, 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 a giant gizzard a, shed. A ten ounce gizzard? Ten ounces. Oh, okay. So Shaw Grigsby's big fish on day one was eight pounds and three ounces, and they weighed the gizzard shed with the fish yesterday, eight pounds, 13 ounces. So just imagine that getting to live well. Uh, and 10 ounces shy of what you thought you had. And it takes a big gizzard shed to weigh 10 ounces, by the way. I would they are paper thin. <laughs> yeah, it's it's half partly like digested, line. too. He was holding it up on stage. It was pretty funny. Yep. Oh, my gosh. 10 ounces the, the, out the door. All right. Okay. Maybe we can dig up the the, the, the footage of that from the weigh-in yesterday. That'd be some fun to watch. Let's take a look at our updated leaderboard as per Bass Track right now. See who's on top. And there we go. Brett Height. Catching the boat, Jake, Jacob Wheeler still looking for his first keeper of the day, Jamie Hartman, holding his spot right there and on down the line. Todd Faircloth moving up ahead of There's our two Texans, Faircloth and Keith Combs right in there. Matt Lee, could this be the week for Matt Lee right after the week uh, for our other Lee brother? So, uh, you know, tell me what's going to happen. We're going to take a break, hoping for pictures. See you in a minute. The Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend is brought to you by... Berkeley, Hook, Humminbird, Mercury, Minn Kota, and by Nitro Boats. Facts matter. All monofilament is not the same. Berkeley is the strongest, smoothest, most dependable monofilament line in the world. Why would you risk your fishing trip to a line that's made who knows where just to save a buck? Berkeley has been making and perfecting trialing in America for over 75 years. I spool nothing less than the best that's Berkeley trialing, and that is a fact. <laughs> Champions aren't born, they're created. Every turn of the prop, every mile on the lake, every cast of the rod, every fish they catch, and every pound they weigh. It builds who they are. It builds a legacy. Hey, thanks, Dave. Out of office? Oh, man. Hi, this is Skeet. Skeet. Out of office? Dude, don't be mad because I thought of it. What? I gotta go. I got someone to the line. Go to teamgtfishing.com to check out my real job. We're supposed to be working. I am working. Is there a place where the underwater images are the clearest you've ever seen? We're seeing every fish, we're seeing every detail of structure, and where every bottom contour was visible, where whatever you wanted to see below the surface was real. Do you want to go? Structure Scan 3D is the future of fishing. We can show you how to find fish faster and catch fish in a way you've never experienced. Let's get them. Is this being in the moment? Is this hanging out? And is this really playing with your kid? Don't stop what you're doing to capture what you're doing. Keep running, keep playing, keep dancing. Just keep doing. GoPro, start recording. Toledo Bend, being brought to you live by PowerPole. The man said Bassmaster Live, coming to you from Toledo Bend. That's what he meant to say right there, brought to you by PowerPole. Today, five and a half more hours, I think, of Bassmaster Live coming. We don't have yeah. much live to offer you right now. Again, we're in a remote place. It's kind of a luck of the draw to where these guys land and wherever they're fishing at any certain point of the day as to whether or not we'll have a picture. Pictures are not available by any means 
all, all over Toledo Bend, but we're gonna just hang with you as much as we possibly can. We don't want to kill you. But <laughs> we don't, but it'll, it'll happen because it'll happen. covered tournaments last year and you know previous years, a lot of them are in this. Just depends on where the guys are and the weather and the wind and the moon and all those things, I guess. Next, next hour, we, we may have all five, all four guys of our Rappel of Four Live out there fishing for you today. We think back about, we see, uh, well, what happened right as we went to break, Ronnie? Something something uh, popped we saw, up? We saw oh, Matt Lee. Uh, Matt Lee caught another fish. He moved up to the top three in the leaderboard. So catching some numbers early, which uh, on a place that you can do or die sometimes, it's probably good to capitalize on that early bite, that shad spawn bite. <laughs> And we saw it yesterday, some numbers from yesterday's fish catches. The first three hours of the day were the only hours where we had over 100 fish catches per hour. After the first three hours of the day, it tailed off, and we had 80 to 40 fish catches per hour. So the first three hours were definitely the witching hour. You better get your numbers because you might catch a big one later, but you better get your, your limit early. Let's talk about that a little bit because it, at Conroe, the shad spawn was certainly a factor. Yes. And it is here. And I probably got more questions sent to me, social media or whatever, about what is a shad spawn? People living mm -hmm. up north don't don't understand it as much, maybe because it doesn't happen in some places. It depends on your, your shad population, obviously. But where I grew up, there in the Carolinas, the shad spawn has always happened. And now we have the heron spawn. That happens at a different time. But what happens is, these shad have to spawn, obviously, to reproduce, but when they do, they come up in big waves, schools, and, and similar to bass and, and other fish, the moon triggers that, the water temperature, the length of day, all of those things combine. But when this shad spawn is happening, it always is best right at the crack of dawn. They spawn during the night and right at the crack of dawn, and these fish know, somehow, they, they know that those shad have moved up and they're just really vulnerable. Typically, when a shad or, or bluegill or, or any prey that these fish want to ambush, they're weary because they know they have to worry about those bass. Yeah. Even a big uh, 10 or 12 ounce gizzard shad understands that. But when these shad start spawning, they just they just lose all consciousness of, of anything but, but what they need to do. And the shad are obviously what the bass want to, to key on that bluegill and, and crawfish. So it makes it real easy. And, and what you look for in shad spawn, they typically want to be up against something hard, whether it's a rocky bank, a boat dock, a bulkhead like we saw a lot of at Lake Conroe. And they normally, if you have a warm night, it makes it really intensify. And if you have calm winds, those shad will get right up against something and they're just so easy. And these, these bass typically have just spawned themselves. Mm -hmm. The shad spawn is usually right along with the tail end of the bass the largemouth bass spawning, so they need to eat and they need to recover from the spawning process. Sure. So what easier way to do it than just eat a thousand shad? I mean, they, they sure. really do, and, and they're easy. I, I stock threadfin shad in my pond there at my house, and it's really incredible. I didn't have them there for 10 years, so these bass that, that were in this pond had never seen a threadfin shad. And, and the first year when that shad spawn happened, it was I could wake up in the morning at daylight and, and literally see fish schooling along. Along, I have some riprap in my pond. I have a, a hard block, cement block wall right in front of my house, that sort of thing. And those hard places in my pond, it was so easy to see that that's where those shad want to spawn. And the bass know this, and it is the easiest fishing you're going to have around the bass spawn. A lot of what these guys have talked about is the fishing has been tough because they're, you hear them say they're in that funky stage mm -hmm. because they, some of them have just spawned, some of them are about to spawn, and there's just a lot going on. But what you want to find is some fish that have postponed and, and they're ready to recover and they get around these shad spawn and it is lights out. It's like schooling fish. And you will see, I know it happened yesterday. I talked to some of the leaders, You've seen it happen today. You're going to see some guys go from take off, go to first spot, and catch a limit in five minutes. Yeah. You talk about the shad spawn. Was it different sort of not to crack down at Lake Conroe because they have such a prodigious supply of shad down there that, you, you know, you, you talk about the shad spawn here, you, they show themselves. You see you yep. see school and fish because maybe they'd be at the top of the water. They had these clouds of shad that would go all, and the, the, the bass never needed to push things up to the top. It made it, and, and Edwin Evers was one of the guys who sort of cracked the code there. That, that's a great point. 
very seldom do we go to a fishery that has so many shad and the bass population at Lake Conroe, although there's a lot of big fish, there's not a lot of numbers, and I don't mean that in a bad way. There, there are a lot of numbers, but there's more shad. So shad were spawning in a lot of places. You had to find those places where the bass were feeding on them. Mm -hmm. Typically, if you can go find shad spawning, there's going to be bass there. Yeah. But like like Conroe, places, even Toledo Bend, you might find a shoreline that's got shad spawning that don't have bass, and that's not usually the case. Yeah. Well, hey, Dave, go oh, ahead. Sorry to interrupt, yeah. Tommy, mm -hmm. but yeah. Davey, for people at home, you said that, you know, the shad spawn starts to happen at the end of the bass spawn. But we know that bass spawn, you know, in some parts of the region from mid-March through May. Yep. So for people that need to connect the dots for water temperature, what water temperature do you start really looking for a shad spawn since the, the bass spawn, you know, the early 60 degree, mid 60 degree water, when does that shad spawn really start to kick in? That's a, that's a great question and a, and a great point. It's something to talk about. Bass, spawn throughout the country in different waves. If all of the bass in a reservoir went to the bank at the exact same time, it would be lights out. At Toledo Bend, uh -huh. it's a bass factory. If every bass at Toledo Bend went to the bank all at the same time, <laughs> I don't know, it, I'd love to be there if it yeah, happened. Oh yeah. But, but they, they do spawn at different times. And I think it has a lot to do with the age of the fish, where that fish has lived during the year. A fish that lives offshore and tends to live in deeper water, even though they're largemouth bass, some tend to stay shallower, the Florida strain especially, and you do have Florida strain here at Toledo Bend. Those fish that live shallower, that water warms up, starts warming quicker, and, and those eggs develop quicker, so they go and spawn earlier. Those fish that live offshore tend to move up a little later. So not only at Toledo Bend, not only in Florida, although it's magnified in Florida, you have, even in the north, you don't have all the fish go to spawn at the same time. Speaking of the shad spawn and the herring spawn, same deal. Not all of them go at the same time. But what you want to target is that optimum time where most of them are doing it. That's okay. when you better be on the deal. But in the, in the threadfin shad and especially the blueback herring, I've learned, the age classes seem to move in at different times. So it's real important then to pay attention to the size of the bait. We talk about the shad spawn or the herring spawn. There'll be times, especially with the herring, because they get so much bigger, that there'll be three inch herring spawning and you need to throw a bait that's about that size. There'll be times when there's five and six inch herring spawning and you need to use those bigger baits. All right. Uh, still waiting for some pictures. As we say, we're having a little bit of trouble getting, uh, getting you locked in on some pictures, getting ourselves locked in on some pictures. Mark Zona uh, is currently a guy who's traveling, making some miles this morning. He's going to prepare for a, a Zona Live uh, episode coming up next week. Up, uh, up in the north country there, up to not too far from from his place, but we uh, I think we've got him we got him Mark Triton on the line uh, is going to be Mark Zona. Mark, can you hear us? I certainly can, Tommy, and I'd like to say hi to Ron, Michael, Davy, Tom. Before I get to this uh, Zona Live that I'll be working on next week with Kevin Van Dam, a weather challenged Zona Live, I'll actually be working the twelfth hole of the Masters this weekend and uh, providing a little bit of groundwork for the crew there in Augusta, Georgia. That Excited. Just, Weather looks good. Oh. Um, above and beyond that, you guys know, just doing the usual grind. Yeah, that's, you'll be right there at Amen Corner. That is fantastic. I mean, this is a this is a giant sports weekend with Toledo Bend and the Masters going on, and we've got our, our guys uh, obviously spread out over, too. We're got, looking at a picture right now of Jacob Wheeler. Uh, we got we got some good live shot of him, very clear we, live shot. And we've got service, and of all people to have, that's a, the best one I want to watch this morning, the leader, Jacob Wheeler. Mark Zona, but before we get into the particulars of what's going to happen at Amen Corner, why don't you give us your your take on the fisherman that is Jacob Wheeler? Uh, I, I don't know how you stop Jacob Wheeler anymore. In all honesty, you're talking about a person that puts in more leg work than any angler that I've watched the last 10 years as far as uh, the dude lives on the road. Um, and I know you guys are getting a great image, a great picture of Jacob Wheeler. And I'm sure you guys want to hear him. But here's the only thing I want to tell you to, to keep your eye on today, guys, besides that shad spawn. And, and I'll call back later. But watch the late day bluegill spawn. There's a thing that happened on this lake yesterday at about 1 o'clock. Watch for giant cruisers late in the day. Call me when you need me. All right, let's listen here, Jacob. Wheeler hooked up. Number one, anyway. Slide this. Hey, 
Not a big one. We gotta start somewhere. Not a big one. Okay, one thing real quick here, guys. Whenever you use these clips, I like to use like clips that actually don't actually puncture the holes, but if you do, never put it way back in the lip. Way back in there, use it like right there on his lip, and that's not gonna make him, when you release that fish, he's not gonna have an issue with uh, with eating again. He's gonna be fine. So, I see, I see that quite a bit, and something that I look at, and you wanna definitely pay attention to where you clip them. Obviously, if you can, you know, use something that doesn't puncture them, but if you do use those kind of clips, use it like that we just did right there. Love watching Jacob Wheeler throw this buzz bait. You see Jamie Hartman has caught a 412 to jump into the lead, and Matt Lee has caught another nice three plus, and he's climbed up there as well. Yeah, Mark Zona, what do you make see of you, Matt, Matt Lee charging into into the prominence this week? Pretty good to be in the Lee family is what the way I look at that. I reckon. And hey, hey, real quick, on something Davey was hitting on that jab spawn besides me wanting to fish Davey's pond the rest Where's of my life. <laughs> Maybe do a, do a Davey Height live over there with him. Um, hey, with that jab spawn thing, and this was going on next door at Rayburn, okay? Is that jab spawn thing on a lot of those clay points, which Toledo Bend has a million of those just like Rayburn. And I was talking to Jordan Lee about this. I fish that shad spawn every morning for about 45 minutes to an hour and a half. And, and it was like great white hitting baby seals for the first hour and a half. And then I'd bail on it and then kind of, you know, go do other stuff, do some sight fishing and blah, blah, blah. But Jordan Lee told me, and this is something to really watch in this tournament, is after that morning shad spawn, figuring out how to catch some of those bass that stay shallow on those clay points. And Jordan Lee said, look, man, I could catch them the same way I did in the classic, throwing a jig and a big worm. I'm curious to see if some of these places on Toledo Bend set up the same way where a lot of those good ones that concentrate on that chad spawn in the morning, um, if anglers are able to figure out how to catch them in the same areas throughout the day. That's, that's a great, great point. I think, I think a lot of the fish that were caught yesterday from the guys that I talked to, Zona, during the day were caught exactly like you're describing. Not so many people catching them offshore, just a, a couple folks, because if those shad are really committed to that spawn and it is the peak time like I talked about earlier, they don't, they don't spawn and go out to the deep ledges in 20 feet they spawn shallow and they seem to disappear but they haven't gone far and those bass aren't going to move any farther than they have to either so it's a that's a great point i think some guys caught those fish just like that yesterday and this tournament could be won by a guy cranking or doing something offshore during the day but but stuff that's connected to the mainland not not out the humps and the the river ledges like we see so many times here at toledo bend but places just like z described that those shad move to during the day because the next morning they're going to be right back up there in this shallow grass like Jacob Wheeler is fishing here. As we did our, our fly up the lake and looked at our, our four as they were positioned, any, any of those spots surprise you right there? Obviously we're looking at Jacob Wheeler uh, working his buzz bait basically right at the launch, still very, very close to the launch at Cypress Bend Park. I'm loving watching a buzz bait and him <laughs> being close and us having service, that's for sure. That is, that is nice. There's so many fish released here at Toledo Bend. Dave Mercer talked about the tournaments. Where I grew up, a big tournament is 100 to 150 boats. That's a club tournament at Toledo Bend, it seems like. Oh, yeah. They had the Oldman's event down there last week, 450, 500 boats, something like that. It's not uncommon. Okay. 
Z, thank you so much. I know you're trying to trying to get the miles knocked out, and you got a busy day, a busy weekend ahead of you there. And plus, uh, the, the Masters dimension, and the the wind at the 12th hole is just going to be hard to hard to manage today. And I I wish you the best of luck at that. Can we check back check back in with you a little bit later? Absolutely, Tommy. Dog Lake Four. Beautiful weather approaching this weekend. Enjoy it. Check in anytime, friends. Friends, thank you so much. And Mark Zona. Over there at Amen Corner a little bit later today. The great Ben Hogan once said, wait till you feel the wind on your left cheek before you hit your tee shot on the par three of the 12th hole. Y'all are so good. Y'all are just so good. All Thank I can do is sit now. here as well. well. Let's see if we can tune into some, some tournament leader to start this day, Jacob Wheeler. One thing worth noting, uh, I covered Chris Lane last year and we saw how Chris Lane did well with a whopper plopper and top water. Uh, he's not, he's not too far from where Chris Lane's final day starting spot was. Chris, Chris had ran just south of takeoff into the first big creek, and Jacob Wheeler, we can see that looks like the campground, so he's not far fishing that that shoreline, you know, gator grass type grass. So you ask yourself, why is Chris Lane having a tough tournament? Yeah. I can answer that. Okay. This is a very big body of water, as we talked about earlier. If you weren't tuned in the largest lake in Texas and everything's big in Texas. So it's a big place. Chris Lane probably practiced. I, I, don't, I know he practiced where he caught a lot of his fish. He may have done it on Monday. These fish may have moved in here a day or two ago. Does, how much does fishing history against this group of anglers hurt you sometimes? A lot, a lot. You know, earlier, which is still on the subject of that shad spawn, which is uh, high on everyone's mind, obviously, today. Uh, talked to Jacob Wheeler, had a little conversation with him about the shad spawn, and here's what he had to say. Okay, let me explain the shad spawn to you. You pretty much have 45 minutes to an hour in the morning to make it happen. And once it's done, it's done. You can't go back and, okay, go shallow and go catch a couple more on the same deal. It's sort of done. So without missing out on this, I didn't want to miss out and not have an opportunity to a couple bites, which we did. And we had three, three bites. You know, two of them were pretty decent, I felt like. Um, just poor execution. And then you go do something else. Because, you know, basically I feel like there's better things to do uh, later in the day. But you only have 45 minutes in the morning to make hay. And you got to do it quick. That's good stuff. It's amazing talking to Jacob Wheeler, as young as he is. He, he sounds like a guy that's been doing this for 30 years. Oh, my years. gosh. He mentioned that he's had more bites than, than we thought he had had. Poor execution. That's one of the things about throwing a buzzbait. I told you, I love to throw it, but sometimes I get caught up into just enjoying casting that bait and watching it come back thinking that I could catch a giant at any moment. But then there's some days when they'll swirl or they'll hit at it but not want to eat that bait. One thing I'll throw in here also, when you're talking about buzz baits and shad spawn, there's lots of different buzz baits. Some of them clack, some of them rattle, some of them just make bubbles and, and little gurgling noise. The bait that he's throwing would be my choice during the shad spawn. Just, just the bubbles, not the loud uh, buzz baits that, that the click and knock and, and that, that sort yeah. of thing. Yeah. But the one really he's throwing would be my choice. One. Another one. We'll give away something here. I hope he doesn't mind. He's doing, like I said, this guy does stuff that, that veterans do. If you watch him when he's throwing this buzz bait, he doesn't just throw it and reel it back. He, he, he gives his rod. I love watching guys, what, what they do with the rod and exactly the presentation they're making. He'll shake that bait and give it that little, that little sprint, that little 
where it throws out a little more water and looks like something trying to, uh -huh. to get away. And that's that's a veteran move with a, with a bait that a lot of guys don't know anything about, a lot of guys don't do. It's not just a winch it back in kind of no, thing. No, it's not. It's not. Some days, yes, but yeah. during this shad spawn, because these fish have, have been feeding all morning or all night, you need just a little something to trigger them. And just shaking that mm -hmm. rod a little bit to give that, that bait just a little different action is what you need to do a lot of times. You're saying just one more bite. Come on, you can take one more bite. <laughs> one more. One need more. you one more spoonful of shad here. Yeah, buddy. I Dave, know you're full, but yeah. come on. Dave, you got a question on what's the best way to locate a shad spawn when you're out? The best way to locate a shad spawn is to cover as much water as you can. The small window that you have, just like Jacob Wheeler mentioned, it's 45 minutes, it's an hour. It really depends on how quickly the sun comes up. If you got a few, a few clouds, it gives you a little extra time. But a lake like Toledo Bend that is so big, you can't cover it all, right, but right. you've got to move. In practice, you see these guys, some of them just left the classic, a lot of them just left the classic, they're tired. But, but you know you've got to get up and go. You've got to be there right at the crack of dawn and that first hour just cover as much water as you can. Well, are they spawning in the same place day after day that you kind of know in this little bank type area? Or? They'll, be, they'll be in the same general area, but like we saw at Conroe, the wind will move them around, the current will move them around. There's things, they will move a little, but typically when you find a section of the lake where they're spawning, they'll be in that section. That's what you want to be able to do is narrow that down. If you just saw that, I don't know if you saw that, Davey, but as Jacob Wheeler is getting ready to leave, he just took his whole armada of rods on the right side of his boat, picked them up and put them on the passenger side, and then moved the passenger side rods to the front deck. Is, is we, We're going to see that a lot. We've seen anglers well, already talk about that. The is plain, I'll tell you that right now. But we're going to still catch them. We just got to roll while I see the rear pants and go fishing. Let's go make it happen. You saw the move. He just gave up on the shad spawn. Their 45 minutes are up. That's it. That's and I right talk, on time. I talked to this guy last night. He's got other things going on, I promise you. I hope we have service with him because he's got a lot of different things going on and obviously they're working for him. Well, they all play it close to the best on, after the first day, but you, you read the, the, the comments from Jacob Wheeler, so you know, I'm just, I'm just trying to go around, hitting the areas that look good to me. No specifics, anything like that. I hope we, I, fingers crossed, we're gonna get to eyeball 2020, the, the specifics ourselves before it's all over today. Edwin Evers with a solid five pounder in the live well reported on a blog just came in. Look out for Edwin. We, I think we all talked about that yesterday yeah. around here getting ready for this tournament. Edwin had such a good classic going and then that Lake Conroe curveball oh. got him on that final day. He's, he's probably setting the hook extra hard here at Toledo Bend. One thing that we were before Jacob Wheeler started talking was that uh, We've heard, I think I heard a couple pre-tournament interviews, like Brett Height might have been one of them, where he said he's got eight rods for the shad spawn morning time deal, and he's going to put them down and pull out eight more rods for the rest of the day. What kind of deal is that? Are you know offshore rods, or what do you think? You know, still fishing shallow but flipping kind of stuff. Well, the one common thing that I think most of these guys are doing and looking for in the morning is the shad spawn, but once that's over, these guys are going in their own direction, north and south. Some fishing the bank the rest of the day, some fishing offshore. Just a lot of different things going on. That's why this tournament is gonna to be so interesting to watch, to see which strategy works out. Tell you what, I love these pictures. I love taking a ride on Toledo Bend. A lot of worse things you could be doing on a Friday morning Isn't that? right now. He's headed north. He, he was right there, you saw him at Cypress Bend Park. He's headed north and across the lake here. Not far away, it looks like. Let's hope not. Yeah. <laughs> There's no place like home. Let's just keep repeating that to, to Jacob Wheeler. I don't know why I'm sitting on this side of the desk. It's, it's real easy to predict what these guys are doing, but it's hard to execute. <laughs> I said pre-tournament that some guys with Chad Spawn fish in the mornings, and I thought the northern end was going to be a player, all these things, but the, the key to that is 110 of these guys know what's going on. They all know. It's not just that I knew what was going on. These guys are really, really good, but on a lake this big, especially it's just hard to narrow it down and you know what's going on 
what should be the winning patterns, but it's just hard to find those. How about you don't sell yourself short, Davey Hyde? Yeah, I, we, I think back to Okeechobee, and it was like you had seen the film of the tournament before. You made every call right, pretty much right before it happened. God gets lucky every once well, in a while. I'm telling you what, that was, that was stupendous. There's a creek. Where he's headed, there's a creek just not far up here to the left that I fished in last year. I'd be interested to see if he pulls in there. All these little creeks on the west side, basically from Cypress Park, across from Cypress Park on down to the dam, have played pretty much a role in, in the winning efforts, yeah. uh, with the exception of uh, uh, Brent Chapman, who was on the other side of the lake. I mean, they've been a, they've been a part of it. Yep. Unfortunately, maybe it'll pop, that signal will pop back in. There's a still image of what Jason Christie's doing right there. No surprise to me, Jason Christie is doing what he does. That's, that's what's cool about going to a big lake like Toledo Bend with, with so much variety. You've got shallow grass, you've got offshore fishing, but Jason Christie loves to throw a frog around that shallow vegetation. All right. First hour is uh, in the books here. Bassmaster Live. Mark Zona, thank you for joining us on his way uh, both to the North Country and Augusta at the same time. I don't know how he's going to handle it, but uh, he's an amazing individual. Oh, there we go, the green jacket. That was look at that Tommy. Was yes, look at, I remember that classic moment where bass fishing and golf sort of came together. Uh, Clarksville Reservoir, not too far from Augusta. People still scratching their heads. Steve Bowman among them <laughs> as to what went on there. Me too. I don't know exactly what happened there, but that was fun. Jamie I had Hartman. a good tournament there. You had a good tournament. <laughs> you, you, you were scratching your head just a little bit. Just a little. Jamie Hartman, the New York angler. We saw him in Cherokee. And like you said, no surprise that he did well there. Maybe shocking a few folks here today. Now he's risen to the top of the leaderboard. One hour into the fishing on day number two at Toledo Bend. Bassmaster Elite. We'll be right back with more Bassmaster Live. Man, it's slow today. Yep. Mom, I caught a fish. Good job, Sweet. Hey, what kind of lure is that? It's a Livingston. They have electronic bait fish sounds that activate as soon as they hit the water. Easiest way to catch a fish. Hey, thanks. The competition is fierce and the prizes are huge. The only thing missing is you. Fantasy Fishing presented by Toyota. Sign up for free and face fans from across the nation. Grand prize winner receives a Triton Yamaha package, including a Triton 189 TRX. MSRP of $37,293. The classic and each individual elite event winner will receive $2,500 Bass Pro Shops gift cards. With the runner-up receiving a GoPro Hero 4 black camera. Sign up and pick your team today at BassmasterFantasy.com. You know that feeling you get when you save money on parts without having to jump through any hoops, track points, or make a bunch of extra trips to the store? Yeah, that's the one. 
Introducing Speed Perks from Advance Auto Parts, a rewards program for guys who love getting under the hood. No cards, no points, no nonsense. You're watching the Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend, being brought to you live by PowerPole. Third stop of the year for the Bassmaster Elite Series. The Bassmaster Elite on Toledo Bend, presented by Econo Lodge. This is Bassmaster Live, heading into our second hour right there. There's our leaderboard as it stands now, unofficially, according to Bass Track. Jacob Wheeler has had the lead to start this day, and uh, he's got the one fish, not a big one, in his live well. He caught on the buzz bait. We did get to see that. Pictures have been hard to come by here. We're thankful for each and every dropper, like a like a thirsty man in the desert out here a little bit, but I believe we've got, I hope, my fingers crossed, we got a picture of Jacob Wheeler live. There he is. Interesting. Uh huh. Not a lot of guys. Got a big crankbait. I'm casting it. Just seen some big ones set up right while I like them. Let's just see if we can't bust one on them. Come on, big. Ooh. Basically, there's a lot of things that these fish are doing. You know, there's fish spawning, there's fish on these flats, they're in grass, there's shad spawn going on in the morning, and there's just a handful of them out deep. And you just gotta pull up in the right place at the right time to make it work. He's gonna catch one here. Looking at his GPS to get on the exact spot, There's, it's so important to have the exact line up and, and make the cast from the exact angle. Now what, in your mind, what is that that he is aiming for right now? What is, what is he lined up on? It's hard to say at Toledo Bend because you have, you have timber offshore yeah. and under the water dangerous to run. You see all these markers in the background. You have a channel you have to run if you've never been there. There's standing timber under the water all around him. So there's two things that he's probably targeting. Number one, some type of a drop, a, a ledge, a contour change. But a lot of times there'll be a stump or a, a, a tree that, that has broken off under the water that those fish will congregate around also. As we say, we sort of perked up a little bit. You saw that saw that big crankbait hey, come out. We thought of last year, but this if was you earlier want to, you today. Can get over, see where that stick is over there? The, that big tree. You can get right to that tree. Just swing around, and you can get right on that tree and get that angle. It's fun watching him catch one on a buzz bait and go straight out throwing the, the crankbait. Hey, man, that's that's what you pay to see. Davey, did you ask him how much time he spent pre-practicing here? Because we got a reader huh. curious about that. I talked to him last night, and I asked him if he pre-fished, which I knew the answer before I asked, but I just had to. He said uh, he did, and I think he put it like a good bit of time, which for him, who knows. Mm -hmm. um, this, guy, this guy isn't just getting out of bed and going out there with those fish jumping in his boat. He's doing his homework. And... When you see a guy work this hard and have this success, you, you've got to, you've got to give him credit. 
So many people think, well, you're lucky. He, this guy's lucky. He's luckier than I am. Hard work. He'll go looking, looking at his graph. On the right side, you're looking, you're looking, you see fish, you see those, those arches? There's some fish where he's at. You see to the left there, the green ball, that's, that's shad, that's bait. Anytime you're fishing offshore, when you see bait and fish, you're in the right spot, and obviously he's in the right spot. He's a leader from yesterday, and this is this was his first move outside of the shad spawn, probably where he caught some of his fish. Some, I would say that would be my move. If I left the shad spawn, I'd go to my best place offshore, just like he's doing. The thing about looking at his graph where he's sitting, if you see shad and fish under where he's sitting, where he's casting, there's more. Because he's probably casting 30 or 40 yards away from what you're seeing on there. So at the classic a lot, I notice on Iconelli's graph, mm -hmm. I, I look at these things. Oh, yeah. Not the, the big picture, but the smaller pictures a lot of times. There was a lot of bait and, and fish around, not only Iconelli, but the other guys that we saw, Jordan Lee, those guys. And those fish were just hard to get to bite. It was hard to trigger a strike. A lot of that comes from pressure and the postponed funk. Yeah, he's just north of the takeoff. Jacob Wheeler left, basically casting right where 110 boats just left for. Yep. If you've ever had a doubt about somebody disturbing your best area, 110 boats just took <laughs> off there wide open. So he started there, and then he went just north, which I, I really thought coming in this tournament, if, there, if a guy is able to catch him offshore, it'll be north. We talked about it. If, if guys weren't tuned in when we started the show this morning, I, I talked a little bit about how the water temperature is probably just a few degrees warmer if you go north. For several reasons, the water color, there's, there's more color up north so that water warms up a little quicker. The other thing is protected from the north winds. Hmm. And you say, where do you start to, to be on the front end of a pattern on any lake? I shouldn't say any, but most of the time, the northern end is going to warm up quicker because it's protected from the strong north winds. And the southern winds will push into that, which pushes that warmer water there. And that west side gets the sun first. He's yep. on the west side. So northwest is exactly where he's at. And yeah. This guy, is, he's really lucky. <laughs> Thought it interesting. He said, "You know what? I'm doing. I'm going right. I'm. I'm not hesitating to do this." But he said, "There's a very few of them have filtered out here." He exactly. said, it, "It was. It was few and far between. Just a few places." Yep. But a lot of times, those are the biggest ones. Yeah. Those are okay. biggest ones. Some, they can be the first to arrive. I want to talk too. Talk real quick about what he's doing. He, the first thing he did when he pulled up is throw the big crankbait. Pro, it looked like a, a Rapala DT16. Mm -hmm. I know he likes to throw that bait a lot. He threw it there and. I think he had one bite, he went, <clears throat> you could yeah, tell. Yeah. Uh, I think he had one bite there on the crankbait, but he's doing something you saw Jordan Lee do really, really well in the classic. He found his fish with the crankbait, but then he ended up fishing slow to get these fish to bite. And when these fish first move offshore, just like in the classic, you have to fish slow for them sometimes. He's got a trigger one to bite, it's over. I'm trying to put on a show. So basically right now, I mean, I'm set up on a place that I've seen a few fish down there and I'm sight fishing in a sense. Um, I'm using those grass and Lorance electronics to, to really show me what's down there. I don't fish a place unless I see them. I just seen a couple big dots down there and <laughs> O'Connell calls them blimps. And, um, you know, sometimes they'll bite, sometimes they won't. You know, you just got to trigger them one into biting, and normally you can catch two or three out of them. But, but uh, or you'll catch singles, one or two big singles. So you just sort of got to, when you see that, you normally stop and catch one. You rotate through a lot of different baits, big crank baits, DT20s. Try not to backlash. <laughs> What's that other bait? A little quick reel, what's that doing? Um, that's just typical hair jig, you know? I mean, that's, that's obviously Chickamauga. Um, was, that hair jig was pretty good to me. And 
that uh, that bait will actually you know flat out catch them. But especially when they're a little bit pressured or set up right, the biggest thing is that bait keeps in contact with the bottom the way that's retrieved. You know, a crank bait, you got to crank that bait down there, get it down there, and it's it, it's only really productive more than 50 percent, probably 50 percent of the cast. Well, that hair jig is productive, you know, at least 90 percent of the cast because you're constantly on the bottom, and this fish that you're fishing for tend to be on the bottom, at least the ones you want to try to catch. Couple of things from what he just said there, I can elaborate on a little bit. I think he said the the fish that are typically close to the bottom is the one that you want to catch. You see, he's, he's hooked up. He's hooked up. That's why. Big and too. Don't do it. It's a big one. It's taking a while. Ooh, barely. Ooh, yeah! Look at that. Awesome. <laughs> oh, it's a good one right there. There we go. Just triggering it up, switching that DT20 right there. I had to switch up a little bit of profile. Put that one here on the big side. Post spawn, good. Right there. Let's get back in there. Let's go. Let's go. Now that fish, if you if you replay that, I twitched it up and triggered him to bite. That's a great shot. That's exactly what he did with his rod. The bait's digging the bottom and just lifting his rod. It just makes that bait, just like with the buzz bait I mentioned, mm -hmm. you, you make that bait do something just a little different. If that fish is tracking that bait and it looks like it's trying to get away, it's fleeing, Long it just bait. triggers these fish to bite. You'll see it right. He stopped it and then just raise your rod tip. Mm -hmm. He just did a DT20 seminar if I've well, ever seen one, you. didn't he? Holy cow. I sure hope we got service he even called for Weaver. the replay. <laughs> he did. <laughs> I mean, that's, this guy's a guy on his game here. And he's giving away a lot of old tricks that... <laughs> that's uh. exactly right. Oh, well, that cast, it definitely did. You say that, Dave, you think somebody mentored him and taught him a lot of those old veteran tricks? I was doing those tricks about the time he was in diapers. He learned them really quick. It took me my whole life to learn them. But I will say, I've got to say again, I know we got some new viewers. Bass Live has changed everything in our sport. It, he just talked about a couple things there. Guys fish their whole life and don't learn. Never, never heard of. Never heard of, haven't oh. learned. You've just learned it in the last 10 minutes. From the hottest guy in the sport. Well, yeah. Well, the co hottest guy in the sport. It's maybe so hard to decide which yeah, 20 no year kidding. old is the hottest guy in the sport. Speaking of Jordan Lee, he's not tracking on bass track, but he's got a five pounder on the block. Wow. Five pounder just caught, and I think he had a, a two earlier, so he's just not right. showing up on bass track. I hate when suckers get one hook. Why do they got to always do that? Pay attention to where he had that fish hooked. Not what you want. Just outside the mouth, the uh -huh. back treble. There again, it's this post-spawn funk. A lot of the guys that I talked to yesterday mentioned that. That's why he's having to show these little tricks and these secrets to get these fish to bite. Yeah, they're not, they're not fully in shape yet. They, are, they do not have the muscle tone back. 
a week or two from now at Toledo Bend, you pull up there on the same place he's at right now, and yep, so he's just barely got, not what you want, but hey, he's got him in his hand, he yeah. went in the live well. That's, that's one that's in. You pull up there and just, just reel that crankbait steadily, probably don't ever get a bite. He's giving up a lot of stuff here, and he's not shy about it. <laughs> Another thing I want to mention real quick, when if he starts talking, I'm going to stop, but in between, because he's, he's showing us so much here. You see he's reeling really fast. It's, it's hard to tell a lot about that, even though you think, well, I need to reel my crankbait fast because of the gear ratio in the reel. He may be using a four to one gear ratio. He may be using an eight to one, okay. but I'm guessing the way he's reeling, this a, a lower gear ratio reel, which less pressure on you to be able to do all day so you have to reel it fast because you're not bringing in as much five line. to one gear ratio that's the big thing with cranking especially when you're throwing a bait like a dt20 or a big crank bait you know you want something that you can crank and wind not wear you out and it's like in this thing right here you know cranking a kuma komodo with a you know a 711 cranking rod you want that to where you're you're throwing it out there and you're wanting a back, you're wanting big long cast because like we talked about, when you, you know, a seven footer is great, you know, for, for cranking shallow, but like we talked about, your crane bait's only down there in the strike zone 50% of the time. So the longer the cast you can make, the more effective you're gonna be and the longer you're gonna be down there because that bait has to dive down to that depth. So that's why a long rod really allows you to get that bait out there a little bit further and get those bites. Gosh, that sucker should be biting. When you get a bite like that offshore, he knows there's another one there. Okay. He's just got to trigger it again. But there's very seldom just a single fish on an offshore place like this. Even early in the year where there's not a lot of them offshore, where you find one, they'll, they'll almost always be at least a couple more fish there. So we'll probably see a few more of his tricks before he leaves. Yeah, here. yeah, that's the, man, that's the gold right there. I'm gonna back off a little bit. I'm gonna pull them out a little ways. Is he hearing us talk? <laughs> I said, you probably see a few more tricks and he lays it down, picks up another rod. Yeah. He got to his waypoint and then he hit spot lock so he can concentrate just on the fish. But he, he, he was looking down at his graph and when he got exactly where he wanted to, he hit spot lock. You think of the, the old Toledo Bend pioneers, the Bo Dowdens and so forth. Boy, if I had that, if I had those exactly. graphics, if I had spot that, lock, that what I could have gotten That boy don't know how I used to have to catch him. <laughs> And I'll tell you, Tommy Sanders, <laughs> when I learned to fish on Lake Murray in South Carolina, I had a boat paddle. There you go. I there sat you. on the front of an aluminum boat. He's hooked up. I ain't that big. Get over here, dude. Not a bad it looks, one. That looks like, looks like on the hair, hair right there. Yeah, it's a chunky one. I'm gonna get him back in the lead though. I pulled that fish. I pulled the fish off a little bit with that crankbait. We got him. We got him. It's all right. It's a guarantee almost. It's a money back guarantee.
he's fishing this hair jig. Something that, that. I mean, that's the thing. I'm letting it fall all the way to the bottom. And that's something that's so key. Actually, that fish right there, I let it sit there on the bottom. He must have been looking at it. And I reeled it up and dropped it. Boom! Got it. Oh, that's a dang big and. Got me hung up. No! Lost him. I probably broke him off. Yo! Freak. Broke him off. Come on. I mentioned that there was probably a drop and a piece of wood, a stump, and a tree that was broken off under the water. And that's, that's what those fish love to, to be around, and it's, it makes it difficult to land. I hear him say I, he thought he'd pulled him off with the crankbait a little bit. That's yep. why I went back to the hair jig. Yeah, Explain that, that. You saw me shake my head, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. This guy is good. Those fish are set up on the bottom, just like he said. And when, they, when they're not aggressive, but they're following oh, the bait, it. he was doing those. That's part of it. He was showing you a few tricks to get on the bite with that DT-20. The wind's got a lot of trees in him. And he talked about you want to fish for those fish that are on the bottom. Well, he caught that one good fish on, on the crankbait. But more of those fish followed the bait, but he wasn't able to get them to trigger. So they come off of the, the bottom, and there's a drop there, just like I thought. And they suspend just off of that drop. Mm. Well, with this hair jig, he's targeting those fish. And he, he noticed that, hey, they've moved off. And he backed off with his hair jig to be able to get those fish to bite once they're suspended off of ah, the drop. Okay. And that was a really big fish. I think it's always 2020. I thought I'd put probably too much pressure on that fish. Should have went to him. I thought I was swimming out. I had it first, and then it just, the thing is, your line's, you know, continuous down there to the bottom, and your line can get caught up in any tree up top, and all of a sudden, Feel right when I you saw him pull all that line off. It wasn't really a backlash. He's probably throwing ten or twelve pound test fluorocarbon. And the, the one thing, I love fluorocarbon line, but one thing about it, it, it burns. If you have a small little loop down in your spool and you make a cast and that loop hits the reel, some uh -huh. part of the reel, yeah. it'll burn it instantly. So you, if you have the smallest little loop with braid or with mono, there, you can get away with it. Hair jig in her mouth. Gosh, dang, it's a dang biggin too. You could just tell that was a dang biggin. Well, that fish is living in his head big time mm. right now. Let's replay this catch. All right. Look at his rod boat up there in that fish pool. Mm. We all get excited when we hook a big a fish, hoping that it's a big one. I promise you, the way his rod was bowed over there, that was a Toledo Bend mm. mama, big mama. And he knows it right there.
Mm. That's big. I mean, I'm freaking big. I'm not talking about a five, six pounder. I mean, a freaking Megan. Like, mega. Just one more bite. Well, it was rough going for pictures early this morning, but finally we did get hooked up and we got hooked up with the guy who had the lead and had lost the lead, and this is how he got it back. Let me tell you, if you missed that and you ever wanted to fish offshore, oh. you better talk to a friend. Hopefully somebody recorded it because I'm telling you, Jacob Wheeler just put on an offshore seminar. He only landed the one big fish, but he talked about what he was doing and how he's doing, and then he lost that giant. Hey, let's get going with a little Dixie Peck tires and wheels. Bassmaster Elite Series trivia, I think it's time. David, let's do this right now in the four elite events on Toledo Bend. Which angler is the only one to make three top 20s? That's a good question right there. Was it Kevin Van Dam, Chris Lane, Dean Rojas, or Todd? Fair cloth. All, all of those are good, oh, yeah. good possibilities. Tough. I got my pick. All right. I'm going to save it. Hang on to that, everybody at home. Make your picks. We'll be back. Hopefully, we'll have some more good Jacob Wheeler stuff for you as well. Bassmaster Live will continue after this break. Facts matter. All monofilament is not the same. Berkeley is the strongest, smoothest, most dependable monofilament line in the world. Why would you risk your fishing trip to a line that's made who knows where just to save a buck? Berkeley has been making and perfecting trialing in America for over 75 years. I spool nothing less than the best that's Berkeley trialing, and that is a fact. <laughs> Champions aren't born, they're created. Every turn of the prop, every mile on the lake, every cast of the rod, every fish they catch, and every pound they weigh. It builds who they are. It builds a legacy. Tennessee, how's everybody doing today? We are excited to get this season kicked off. It all starts here. Barely hooked, baby. Barely hooked. Ooh, yes! Yeah! That's what I'm talking about. Stay down, stay down, stay down, open your mouth, open your mouth. Yes! <sighs> Thank you! Yeah! That's a big one. That's for you, Mama! How about that right there now? Woo! Ooh, yes! 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 Master Elite second event for 2017 at legendary Lake Okeechobee. So much tradition here and so many amazing eye-popping <laughs> results. Yeah, buddy's right. 
Yes! Yes! Give me some high five on that! Yes. Let's get a closer look at that one. I ain't never flipped a fish that big before, I don't think. Woo! Damn. What is this meeting about again? Fishing! Shit. Took my boat, <coughs> boom, jumped over it, and I caught a giant. It was like a whale. 29 pounds, baby! That's the last time I danced on stage. <laughs> wow. Chief fishing officer. How do I get that job? I don't know. <laughs> Go to teamgtfishing.com to find out more about my real job. Is there a place where the underwater images are the clearest you've ever seen? We're seeing every fish, we're seeing every detail of structure, and where every bottom contour was visible, where whatever you wanted to see below the surface was real. Do you want to go? Structure Scan 3D is the future of fishing. We can show you how to find fish faster and catch fish in a way you've never experienced. Let's get them. Is this being in the moment? Is this hanging out? 
And is this really playing with your kid? Don't stop what you're doing to capture what you're doing. Keep running, keep playing, keep dancing. Just keep doing. GoPro, start recording. You're watching the Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend, being brought to you live by PowerPole. Seen a few elite little things already this morning here on the Bassmaster Elite Series, third stop of the year. Toledo Bend Reservoir. Here's some Bassmaster Elite Series trivia. The answer coming up. Here's the question. Dick Cepec Tires and Wheels Trivia. In the four elite events on Toledo Bend, which angler is the only one to make three top 20s? These are all great candidates. Kevin Van Dam? Was it Chris Lane? Was it Dean Rojas? Or was it Todd Faircloth? I think it's time to roll that one out. What was your guess? Well, Davey? it's hard to not say Kevin Van Dam. You know he won last year, and he just always seems to be oh, in the yeah. top 20. But I'm going to go with D, Todd Fairclaw. I'm going to go with C, Dean Rojas. What is it? Ding, 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 Davey Hyde. Oh, Davey Hyde. Hey, he was nice in 2000. Todd, Todd Faircloth. And how's Todd doing in this tournament right now, Ron? That's well, Todd after Faircloth. day one, Todd Faircloth was in sixth place. That guy is a stick. Mm. Very small here. limit today, about seven and a half. All right. But he's climbed up. There's our raffle of four right there. Jamie Hartman, Brett Height, Jacob Wheeler, Jason Christie. Jacob Wheeler's been the guy we've been able to hang with today as he lost the lead, dropped down below fifth place, and regained that lead. Now, now joining the party, Jason Christie. That's good news. And like we talked about this morning. Awesome. Cool thing about this tournament, we're going to see a lot of guys doing different things and having success doing all of them. We had a deep water well, seminar. We got two. Now here's Jason talking to us. No good ones. No. Oh. Learn it. Go back just the same. Now, just as we got him talking there, we'll, we'll get him to repeat that when we get a little picture clear up on uh, yep. Jason Christie right there, back in a very small creek, little pocket. But like I was saying, we will get to see guys having success right up on the bank. You can see the bottom. When Jason Christie told us this morning he knew what he was looking for, it's because he can see it with his eyes. He's fishing so shallow, he can see it. And he's, he's probably in these pockets looking for a little mixture of grass and nice sandy bottom where these fish are spawning or have just spawned. And there to the right, you have Jacob Wheeler, which if you missed the last hour of live, oh you gosh, missed a you lot. Missed it. He put on a shad spawn. Here's why I'm doing it. And he left there, went straight out offshore, started throwing a DT-20, caught a big one, lost, had a giant break him off, had his rod doubled up. And he talked us through every bit of it, exactly what he was doing and why. And gave up some nuggets that <laughs> yeah, you, I, I, I saw your jaw drop. <laughs> I saw your jaw drop. I would be so mad right now if I was out there fishing because <laughs> you don't need to be telling the other million 20 year olds this same stuff. Because that's that's why we that's why we've got these great young fishermen. Jordan Lee put on a show at Conroe and Jacob Wheeler has had so much success early, and they've learned a lot at a young age, and a lot of it is because of Bass Live. You guys mentioned Kevin Van Dam in the Deep Dick CPEC trivia. Well, Kevin Van Dam just caught himself a six pounder, classified strictly as a post spawn fish, and he told his marshal that, you know, a couple weeks ago, this thing would have been even bigger, but it was a six pounder, bona fide post spawn fish. So, real nice pictures of it going up on the blog real soon here. Check it out, Bassmaster.com. I, I mean, I was just uh, watching Wheeler work there and talking about w what he's going for. I got to think Kevin Van Dam is going to be keeping that same thing honest at some point today, right? Maybe, maybe that's where that one came from. Kevin definitely will, because the winds blew so hard. I saw pictures and a few videos from the guys. When it blows 30 to 40 miles an hour like it was, I know on the final practice day, and it blew hard before that. It's just, you can't get out there and find these offshore fish. And when there's not a lot of them out there, a lot of them are still up on the bank, but you know the way to win this event, Kevin showed last year, if there's a decent amount of the fish offshore, that's where you can win the tournament because they'll be grouped up. And 
Kevin knows that. Parents Jacob knows that, right obviously. Now. But it was hard for these guys in practice to find them. And because it's hard to find them, it forces you to fish shallow because you simply can't do it in practice. So you get on a pattern in shallow water that isn't as good as you want and you, you, you start thinking it's a little tough. But guys like Kevin Van Dam, Van Dam, you know he's got enough experience and he's got enough confidence to go out there and basically practice, look for those fish during your tournament mm. time. To see a Jacob Wheeler do that at his age, to know that this is where oh, it's going to be one, and maybe I haven't found the winning fish yet, but to just get out there, it's, it's awesome. Just got a blog that our classic champ has a limit. Got another three and a half pounder, so he's at least over 10, but uh, we're trying to see why his bass track isn't, wor isn't working and updating. It's interesting. I talked to Jordan Lee. Yep. Yes, no, uh, I guess it was Tuesday. I said, how's practice going? He said, it's, it's a little tough. I hadn't found them very good yet. I said, you're just celebrating that big check and winning the world championship. And he said, yeah, a little, but I'm not going to use that for an excuse. That's, He's, there you go. That's him all over, isn't it? Yep. Boy, he's showing all the tricks. <laughs> that was a big worm. I thought he was fishing that hair jig again. He yep. was working it similarly, but that was a big I Texas will. rig. These trees eat about everything else. That's right. That's not even a big one. He's throwing a big spoon now. That's mm -hmm. what Brick Chapman used to win the event. Absolutely. In 2012? 12? Yes, yeah. absolutely. Mixing it in with some cranking and a little cool. bit of jig fishing, just like we're seeing here with Jacob Wheeler. Basically, just across the lake. Yep. In 2012, Jacob Wheeler was about 14, probably watching it on Bass Live, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Him and Ronnie Moore were sneaking a look at it in the study hall. <laughs> I had just I had just progressed from the crib to my own bed, according to Zona. <laughs> and look at you now, you got your own bedroom. That's fantastic. My own apartment, it's nice. Yeah. Ah, made their own cast right there. Not real human, that's just a waste of cast. If you haven't thrown this big, a big spoon like this, he made the wrong cast oh, there. Man, guys. It's so big and flat, it'll it'll just sail on you. Kind of like my pit, first pitch did a minute, mate. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up. But, but you you just it's hard to cast it accurately. It'll when you try to make a long cast with it, sometimes it, it'll go literally thirty feet left or right. What kind of rod set up? You know, line, what, what do you want to do if you're throwing that like spoon? The exact opposite. <laughs> this is like you might trigger him to bite. You might grab, you might catch a shark. Tuna. That's a good question, Ronnie. I, I experimented with a lot of different rods doing this. You can trigger them. I like a big rod, a seven or seven and a half foot rod. It looks like what he's using here big heavy rod because you really need to make that spoon jump and if you've never fished offshore a lot 
and you see what he's done today? At the end of the day, you're ready for a nap. The way he was reeling that crank back. down there and told on us. The way he's jerking that Freaking big spoon. Paddle tail. <laughs> I hate that too. Hate it. Yeah, that feeling you get where the, the tip of your shoulder blade to the, to the top of your, oh, yeah. that trapezoid muscle, it just feels like a cold wedge of yeah. iron or something like it. Yeah. And I, when I was paddling, my other arm got really sore. <laughs> that's right, yeah. That was your spot lock back in the day. Yeah. yeah. But that is one thing that's taken some of the work out of what he's doing here. He's, he's not even having to put his foot on the trolling motor. For the viewers at home, he just said that there was a tattletale down there. You know, when you're fishing school and fish, especially offshore, when he lost that one earlier, what does that do to that school sometimes? That's a, that's a great question. Mm -hmm. You never want to lose, especially the first bite or two when you're on an offshore spot because it tends to turn those other fish off. That and the other thing it'll, it'll do is those fish will follow that fish, especially after it's hooked up, thinking that that fish is feeding, and they'll just naturally go follow that fish looking for an opportunity to feed and it pulls those fish off away from where they were set up and where they're a lot easier to catch. Brett Height with three and a half pounders is going to be taking the lead here any second. Make one more cast, we got to roll. We on a fish. With all these boats. Problem is, you get out here and you fish and you get enough spectators and you get one or two guys that you know, that want to fish and you can leave your spot and they're on it. So, sort of a tough ordeal. It's a chess match, especially when you're leading. I'd much rather be in about 10th place with nobody watching you. And first, it's just it's hard to, hard to win an offshore game with lost spectators. Yeah. No. What do you say about that? <laughs> Be on himself. Woody? Yeah, you just gotta let them set back up. I think a lot of them guys won't fish it. They just graph it and they're like, okay. It's like, oh, I got, I got a KVD spot. Ha oh, ha. Good. Hey, even on Navionics, there's a spot and it, there's a cursor and it says KVD. Yeah. I'm like, what? <laughs> like, really? Y'all got them like that? All right. All right, we're gonna go somewhere else. I hate to do this this early, cause it's like, gosh. Oh, don't do it. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's been so good. So oh, it good. has. Oh, my word. Hey, a, he lot, made... a lot to chew on there. Let's take a look at Jacob Wheeler before it all started this morning. Okay, let me explain the chat spawn to you. You pretty much have 45 minutes to an hour in the morning to make it happen. And once it's done, it's done. You can't go back and, okay, go shallow and go catch a couple more on the same deal. It's sort of done. So without missing out on this, I didn't want to miss out and not have an opportunity to a couple bites, we did. And we had three, three bites, you know, two of them were pretty decent, I felt like, um, just poor execution. And then you go do something else. Because, you know, basically I feel like there's better things to do uh, later in the day. But you only have 45 minutes in the morning to make hay. And you got to do it quick. Okay, one thing real quick here, guys. Whenever you use these clips, I like to use like clips that actually don't actually puncture the holes. But if you do, never put it way back in the lip. 
way back in there, use it like right there on his lip. And that's not gonna make him, when you release that fish, he's not gonna have an issue with, uh, with eating again. He's gonna be fine. So I see, I see that quite a bit and something that I look at and you wanna definitely pay attention to where you clip them. Obviously, if you can, you know, use something that doesn't puncture them, but if you do use those kind of clips, use it like that we just did right there. There's one. Now that fish, if you if you replay that, I twitched it up and triggered him to bite. He's giving up a lot of good stuff here. Oh, my, You'd man. think he was just doing a zone alive and not <laughs> leading a Bassmaster Elite tournament. Real important here, and it, most guys would never tell you what they did, and if you weren't paying close attention, you wouldn't see. These fish are, are not aggressively feeding. You gotta do little tricks to, to get them to bite. And he was reeling along, steady, lifted his rod tip up, and you can see right after he did it, he hooked up. The other thing you notice, fish is barely hooked. That tells you they're not active, they're not feeding, so you need to use every trick you've got in the book to get that fish to react and bite. That's the one that pretty much got him caught up and back on top right there, Jacob Wheeler. Again, he started with the shad spawn action, the buzz bait earlier today. Yep, you see he gave that, that yep, buzz yep. bait, that little twitch, that fish was probably following it, could have been following it for 10 feet, and that just, that one little trigger pull got that fish to bite, his first fish of the morning. Well, you're talking about a guy who's on the job, Jeez. obsessed with fishing 24 hours a day. I don't think there's any substitute for that. When you're, when you're every subject that goes through your brain during your waking he, hours is, is about how to win a tournament, he, it's going to have results. Tommy, that is a great point. I've been around him early in the morning, late at night, at, at riders' events and that sort of thing. All he talks about is bass fishing. Yeah. And he tries to drain every little information from everybody he's <laughs> around, and he absorbs every bit of it. Were you a little shocked at how much he gave up to us? I am. Out there I on the water? 100% am. And I'm telling you, I'm glad I'm sitting on this side table right now because I'm loving him right now. I'd be like, if I was still fishing the Elite Series, I'd be like, dude, do you realize what you just gave up? Hey, that was my deal, Jacob. <laughs> yeah, that was my secret. <laughs> and me and Kevin kept that secret for 15 years. Now you're telling everyone. Well, just the, just the thing with the... Yeah. And talking about good information, not just information, not just oh, no, giving no. up. Because I know a lot of people that are watching are skeptical. Well, that's not really... A but you're seeing it from the guy that's leading the tournament. He's taking time to show you his tricks, to show you the secrets that so many guys have kept near and dear to their chest for so many years. And if you doubt his resume, just consider he's already won once this year. Yeah. <laughs> trying to win two out of three Elite Series events, which is phenomenal. Oh, it is. And that's the fish on the hair jig. It was a, another little trick he pulled out of the hat. Caught. A good many of his fish when he won Chickamauga at the Bass Fest mm -hmm. event with this hair jig. But he, he had them laid out. He had the good stuff laid out on his front deck. Like you said, he, he, the crankbait had pulled him off, yeah, off the little structure. They were out there suspended. He tells you that's when you reach for the yeah. hair jig. Get the, get Not the only is he showing you the stuff, like he's explaining why. Right there. Yeah, it's a chunky one. Unfortunately for him, he's got one of those one of those fish down there wearing that as a mustache. Oh, right yeah, yeah. This, look at look at his rod. That's a giant. He would be leading in a up. big way. No. Got Rook just landed one of those. He's got a seven pounder. Might help him climb inside the cut. He started 61st today. Good deal. Those are the kind of move you up the board. Yeah, he quite likely might have had 15 pounds if he put that one in the boat. Yep, yep. Ah! 
proud to announce that we're back to Jacob Wheeler live here. I hope we're with him all day because I oh talked to him God. last night. And when I talk to a guy this early in the tournament, I don't ask them to give up their secrets. I don't know why I don't ask Jacob Wheeler because he's giving them up on live. But he's got a lot of different things going on. It'll, I thought. It'll be awesome. Yeah, freaking big and so Big old tree knockers. You can tell he's really dialed in. Well, for the most part, I've been running the shad spawn in the mornings. I've been fishing out wide uh, in the afternoons. Obviously, there's an hour window there and that, when that shad spawn really goes down. And you know, trying to capitalize on that is, is really important because it's not like you're gonna get 100 bites out here, out deep, it's just, there's only a handful of them out here and you gotta make sure you, every bite you get, make it count. But for me personally, I mean, I've been rotating through a lot of different things, you know? I mean, talking about swim baits and crank baits and hair jigs and, I mean, you know, it's just basically, I. I you never get married to a bait. That's always how I've always been. You never get to where you're caught up. Obviously, I'm pretty partial to an air jig, but I never, I let the fish tell me what's, what's going on. And depending on how they're set up is what I'm gonna throw too. So, um, are they in trees? Are they not? What's happening? You know, so it, each technique is, is totally dependent on each area and where the fish are set up on that place. So it's, um, that's the biggest thing probably than anything. And we got first and second live coverage, Tommy. We're right where we want to be. <clears throat> Once again, Jamie Hartman from the Lake Oneida area up there near Syracuse, New York, and came down and really gave us a little clinic on smallmouth, catching numbers of them at Lake Cherokee. That was fantastic. He did, and I was real impressed. I talked to Jamie last night a little bit and he said he had a tough practice he was just having a junk fish he called it and i mm. said i don't think it's too junky it's one name where you <laughs> are you like two like fives you like two five pounders jamie hartman's another guy that is spending a lot of time doing his homework a lot of time well, that was a big part of the story. He had uh, moved out of the house, gotten rid of it, filled up his truck and hit the open road and just let let whatever happens, happen. And you gotta respect somebody's passion for doing that. But for, obviously it's working out good for him and he's been successful. There's been a thousand guys try the same thing and Absolutely. it didn't work out. It is, it is, it is not a guarantee to no. anybody. Just because you sell your house and go fish a lot doesn't mean you're going to be able to beat these guys. But he's done a good job at it so far. He's, he's had a great start for his first year. By watching Jacob fish these offshore spots, he, he's totally dialed in. 
when you're looking for a group of fish offshore, you're covering water, you're working around a certain contour with, with the bait that he's throwing, that DT-20, he's probably keeping the, the boat in 25 to 40, depends on where, how, how much contour is there, how sharp it is. But he's fishing in the probably 16 to 20 foot range using the bait that he's using more than likely. So when he pulls up, instead of working around a contour, he's making exact cast, putting the trolling motor on spot lock, and he's done his homework. He doesn't have to search for 150 yards around this ledge. He knows exactly where those fish are positioned. And he showed us earlier, when they're not positioned, they moved off, he, he knows what they're doing then. Impressive. Homework is, is a word you associate with this guy. I mean, we saw him at Chickamauga. They got some extra places, got some sneaky spots, you know, that sort of thing. This place has been fully bedded here. He didn't just roll up on this right. spot, right? And what's incredible, sneak holes, I think he called sneak it. Sneak holes, at, that's at, it, yeah. At Con, not Conroe, Cherokee. This guy's got sneak holes at Chickamauga, Cherokee, Toledo Bend, and he's 20, mm. how many? I, 27, 28, something yeah. like that. You expect Kevin Van Dam to have sneak holes at all those places, <laughs> and he does. Yeah, he does. Numbers one and two out there. Wheeler on the right, Jamie Hartman on the left. Let's take a look at our hummingbird lay of the lake. You see how these guys are laid out here. The closest to the dam is Jamie Hartman. You know, we've been here a lot, obviously. We typically see more leaders down towards the dam. A lot of these guys are mid-lake to own up the lake. Brett Hyde is in an area of the lake where when there's no grass anywhere else on Toledo Bend, it seems to be around six mile on Housing Creek. And that's the area that you would sort of expect to see him in. Then you just go, Jacob Wheeler started right at the launch, fished the shad spawn for about 45 minutes, went a little bit northwest, which is exactly where I think is the perfect place to be for those first fish to be moving offshore. Take you on up past him to uh, Jason Christie, our, our northernmost angler, and really not, not any guys that we're covering any farther north than that. A little bit of a surprise today in that, that you say that that part of the lake up there going to be a little farther advanced. It, far it is. Um, I'm sure there's guys up there, but they just haven't put fish in the boat yet this morning. Some good stuff in the past hour here. Absolutely. We take a look at our, what's happened on the leaderboard. Bass Track is going to tell us who's been making the move so far this morning. We know that we got Jacob Wheeler and Jamie Hartman, one and two, or did as of a few minutes ago. We head back into one of these little creeks on the west side here. For a lake that I said is so big, you tell three guys, yeah. well, maybe, maybe a spectator or two. Well, that's the way it always turns out sometimes. Brett Height now back on top. Brett Height catching good all through this tournament so far. Wheeler, Hartman, Christie, Fletcher, Tryon. Advanced up the leaderboard yesterday, and he's going to hang in there. The Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend is brought to you by Shell Rotella, Yamaha, Triton Boats, Toyota, Power Pole, and by Skeeter Boats. Man, it's slow today. Yep. Mom, I caught a fish. Good job, Sweet. Hey, what kind of lure is that? It's a Livingston. They have electronic bait fish sounds that activate as soon as they hit the water. Easiest way to catch a fish. Hey, thanks. If you love bass fishing, then show your support by joining BASS today. Since 1968, BASS has been serving bass fishing enthusiasts with information and tournament coverage that make you a better angler. When you sign up today, you'll join over half a million outdoorsmen who love bass fishing. 
With your membership, you'll receive every issue of Bassmaster Magazine, plus $50 in free gear, including a membership tackle bag, BASS cap, plus more. Log on to Bassmaster.com to join Bass today. You know that feeling you get when you save money on parts without having to jump through any hoops, track points, or make a bunch of extra trips to the store? Yeah, that's the one. Introducing Speed Perks from Advance Auto Parts, a rewards program for guys who love getting under the hood. No cards, no points, no nonsense. You're watching the Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend, being brought to you live by PowerPole. Bassmaster Live coming at you this morning, this Friday morning, day number two. Toledo Bend, Bassmaster Elite Series event. Take a look at that leaderboard right now. We got a Brett Height on top. Jacob Wheeler had the lead back for a little while. Jamie Hartman right on his heels. Dick Christie hanging in there as well. Brett Height, uh, we. We're not seeing him. We haven't seen him yet. We got a text from Steve Bowman to the area. Hyde fishing. Hyde is fishing in is in the very back of the creek, and it uh, it goes on and on. He's got a great long text here. I don't know if he also posted this on the blog, but uh, when it comes off, you ought to you ought to read it about describing the area that uh, Brett Hyde is fishing. Basically, all the way back in a creek, and where three or four drains come in, creating little humps and, and little little stopping places, little avenues and two beats of the tail and they're down into 30 feet already so right. that's a good spot right yeah it's a you good betcha. spot right there dave mercer on the line triton on the line with dave mercer dave mercer now we can see you better now dave you got some sunlight on you now we were we were kind of having to pick you out of the dark there what do you make of what we've seen so far i know you're an avid watcher of uh, the bassmaster live stuff some good stuff from wheeler huh Definitely. I mean, it's glorious. I mean, straight up. I mean, that's the only way to explain it. I mean, I said that his day, his career is 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 a theme song and glorious it is. <laughs> Speaking of which, Bobby Roode, the wrestler that literally comes out to the greatest entrance song in the history of entrance songs, glorious retweeted us this morning he agrees bobby Roode himself uh wwe wrestler from uh nxt he's the champion and he agrees that jacob wheeler's day is absolutely glorious but i have a glorious stat that will blow you away here okay um crack bassmaster reporter stevie wright fed me this uh just moments ago our big bass obviously caught by jason christie our phoenix boats big bass from yesterday nine pounds ten ounces you may have mentioned you may have noticed on stage he mentioned that it had a tag and we kind of joked about whether he was winning that's a part of the lunker program they have they had 138 lunkers and that's fish over 10 pounds registered as that program in that program last year the reason that fish was tagged is because it was a lunker and you might be asking yourself well i thought it was fish over 10 pounds well that very fish now yesterday was april 6th correct if i'm good with dates Last year on April 8th, that very fish was caught and it weighed 10, 3, 2, and obviously yesterday it was 9, 10. And uh, how crazy is that? And I can't say where it was caught, obviously, because Jason Christie uh, scares me. And if I say that, he will beat me up. So I will not <laughs> tell you where it was caught, but the host has talked to Jason Christie. They know where it was caught the first time. They believe it was caught right in that exact area. I'm talking a cast's distance from where it was reported being caught 
you know, one year and two days earlier. How crazy is that? Well, Dave and Davey, I mean, as, as, as anglers, doesn't everyone want that fish to pass his genes along? I mean, how did he get that big in the first place by being caught twice in, in that short period of time? But that's the kind of fish you want swimming around yeah. out there, right? The, the world needs more big and dumb fish. I mean, because there, there's plenty of big, dumb, stupid fishermen like me that have troubles. But big, dumb fish like that are very rare. And uh, and how, you know, to get that data really teaches you a lot. And I've talked about it. You know, we've all talked about it. One of the coolest things that Bass has ever done, we talk a lot about today in Bassmaster Live, but one of the coolest things ever as a fan growing up was the bass track system that you know jerry used to host and it was absolutely incredible to see what those fish do and this fish makes you believe that it goes right back to that exact spot but i remember i mentioned to jerry a few years ago and he said you know what that taught us he said it taught us sometimes we don't know because we always think that if you release a fish you know it streams along it swims along the contour lines he said we had as many fish do that as we did go right across the middle of the lake but it definitely does show you that these fish when released go back to their area especially in spawning season like we're talking about here this week yeah that was the uh, we're watching jason christie that was the original bass track right there here's here's a bit of <laughs> trivia for for dave and davy right here with that program that jerry instituted for a few years uh, uh, back in the the last decade uh someone who's very much a part of the scene today got his first job working on that project can you name who that person is. I hope you got it, Mercer, because that's... I can. Uh, I got it. I, I got it. You. I got it. I'll, I'll let Davey guess first. Uh, Take a we're, guess. We're a team, Dave, and I have no idea. I wish I knew. I've got to lean on my teammate here. I know... Ex Lay it out, Dave. I know exactly who it is. It, it know exactly who it is. It is star-studded Bassmaster photographer James Overstreet. You may wonder how he got here. He started as Jerry McInnes' fish jockey. Overstreet would go to the events. How cool is this job? I always say I have the greatest job. Viewers, tell me this isn't the greatest job ever. He used to go to the events, you know, 10 days before, you know, the event started. He would fish before official practice. He would catch those fish and tag them so they could track them throughout the week and do the segment. So that is actually how James Overstreet started. And look at this in timing. James Overstreet is right here. James Overstreet, come join us. We're talking to him. No, he does not want to be on he does camera. What? Said so last time he did that, he had to come to events 10 days early. But James Overstreet now just lounges on the dock as you can see but uh, like years ago he used to work very very hard <laughs> looks like wow. he still still got a pretty good job yeah yes yeah, st the good jobs say <laughs> tend to linger for for the world's most interesting man aka <laughs> james overstreet right there what else have you got for what, what what little nuggets have you got for us dave something that maybe we have overlooked trying to track this tournament so far on bassmaster.com I think the big thing that this tournament is going to go down to the, you know, to the cut today. And I know we say this stuff all the time, guys. But really, if you watched yesterday Bass Track, I mean, David Fritz especially, he caught uh, and what was almost an eight pounder with, you know, 20 minutes left to go in his day. I think he believe I believe he said, and we saw a lot of that. So I think really this tournament much different than when we've been here in the past. Sure, the fish, you know, we've already looked at the numbers on the blog. Stevie Wright's great post there, and how they're a little bit smaller. But this tournament seems to be more dominated by that one big fish bite. And what I'm very curious to see here today is does that continue? Or were those big fish picked off, you know, by this point? Uh, a lot of guys looking at those fish. Um, but one of the things I got to talk about before we go anywhere, friend of the show, and, and we've talked about him many, many times. I know he is watching right now. Uh, Brian Bickle. Brian Bickle, obviously a three-time Stanley Cup uh, winner with the Chicago Blackhawks, now plays for the Carolina Hurricanes and a basically just a, you know a Bassmaster freak. He only plays hockey for money. He wants to be out here, and he just may be out here one day. But he did something that many, um, it's just amazing. It blows me away. Four months ago, he had one of the most horrifying doctor's appointments of his life, and he was diagnosed with MS. And uh, everybody around him said, your NHL career is over. 
everybody except for Brian and Amanda Bickle. I am proud to announce that he returned to the Carolina Hurricanes this week and uh, now is two games into his next run here at the NHL. So congratulations, Brian Bickle. And what a warrior, truly a warrior on and off the ice. He played in the NHL last night. He is getting MS treatments this morning, dealing with multiple sclerosis, battling that. He'll be playing the NHL again tonight and tomorrow night. But what gets him through it, you may be asking. And as you can clearly see, what did he do all morning? Hanging out, getting treatments, and watching Bassmaster Live. And that, my friends, is glorious. That's the winning comment. Hey, that's a man right there can, can put up awesome. with all of that and, and still advance, still move forward at the very highest level. That's, that a, is that's awesome. amazing stuff. Dave, thank you. Thank you so much, Dave Mercer. Leaning on Dave so hard this day. He's back there at Cypress Bend Park. He'll be conducting the way. And always get big crowds here. We talk about we're in the middle of middle of the outback out here, the, the, the American version of the outback. And, uh, man, the crowds show up. The people come from everywhere to Toledo Bend as we take a look at Jamie Hartman. Looks like he's trying to swing on one right there. He was. I, I must have missed that fish. Locking up just a little bit. Well, you see, the, the great thing about being able to watch two different guys, this morning we've, we've been able to watch two different anglers a few times, not, not a lot, but a few times. And the, the cool part about it, they, they'll be doing things that are totally, totally different. And it looks to me like they're fishing their strengths. It's the cool thing about being on a lake like Toledo Bend. <coughs> Jamie Hartman. Yeah. All the way down in there. He took down this time. All the way down in there. How many fish in a row? Uh, but he's fishing offshore because that's what he really, really is good at. He he proved that at Cherokee Lake, where he almost won the thing. I, I mm -hmm. thought he had it won. Jacob oh, Wheeler absolutely. caught a few right there at the end and pulled it out. But when he told me yesterday he was junk fishing, I I assumed that uh, he was probably junk fishing offshore. And before we ever went to Jason Christie this morning, I assume Jason Christie is fishing shallow. He is up north. He's, he was the farthest one up north that we we watching on Arapahoe 5 Live. He's up north fishing a little bit dirtier water. That's That seems to be, from when I've seen Jason Christie on Bass Live, that seems to be what he really likes to do is, is to fish shallow and find the stained water. And, and does quite well at it, by the oh, way. Oh boy, no kidding. This is after day one. Jason Christie is, uh, of course, second place right now as we update day to day on the Bassmaster Elite Series in Toyota Bassmaster Angler of the Year points. Look at that, what difference a day makes right there. Exactly. Jason Christie. Absolutely incredible, Tommy. You look at look at the what one day means in every Elite Series tournament. One day can bring you from being in the top two or three in Angler of the Year all the way down to Jason Williamson was in second. He dropped to 12. Randall Tharp was, what, about third, third or fourth. He dropped off from the pace. But you have to look at the bright side. One good day can move you up that list, especially this early in the year. Yeah, we look at some of the movers and checkers. James Elam moving up there. His uh, classic appearance and, and great work there. There's no fluke. James Elam, strong fisherman and got the Prove himself a little bit more this year on the Bassmaster Elite Series and Ott Depot advancing that lead. Boy, he's going to be a he's going to be a hard case all year long, isn't he? I just had a hunch. Just the way his mentality has been all year, the way he finished up the season last year, winning the final Elite Series. I talk about momentum. People probably get sick of me talking about it, but it means everything in this sport. Ott Depot has the momentum. He's always had the talent. But he was he was hooked weird. Jason Christie just, just landed that smaller in. one right there. That's going to keep, though. We're not talking about 16 inches this week. Yeah. Going to go in the box. Jamie Hartman, Hartman retying on the left. While they go through that business right there with our leader, 
Right now, Brett Height just received, I, I mentioned a, a, a keep my text from line. Steve Bowman. And we're not likely to see him unless he makes a move because he is in the very back of a creek. I'm reading some of his text right here. It's more like a bay or a pockets where three or four drains meet, meet up again. and make a bowl. Might as well grab another Healthy do dose of stumps, a lot of scattered grass. I already got down to Little humps create ditches that, uh, I mean, little drains create ditches that uh, make you in three feet at one second, eight feet in the next. Travel lanes, transition spots, natural highways for the spawn. That's where our leader, Brad Hyde, is camped out. Sounds like a great place to be, and obviously, <laughs> he is leading. Hardly. I'm assuming right. he sent me that lengthy text because he can't even get phone service back there. He's just a little text wow. squeezing through every now and then. They don't get much. And bend it out so it's ready to go. <clears throat> it's harder to get through the grass sometimes, but you need a lot better hookup. Couldn't hear it all there, but I think. Jamie Hartman was talking about throwing a Carolina rig, get a better hookup. I believe that's what he was saying. It's not floating. That's talking about where Brett Height is, uh, the the surroundings, what it looks like via Steve Bowman out there. I hope we get to get a chance to get Bowman on the phone if he gets a spot where he can get just a bar of service there, but uh, you can see he said he's all the way in the back of a creek, and by golly, he is. He really is. He's, he's way back in. That's surprising to me. When I've seen Fred Height, normally at Toledo Bend, he's out on a flat, maybe back in a creek, and this is a big creek, mind you. You're looking at the whole lake, such a big lake, but for him to be in the very back, that's surprising. The, the thing that might have him there, when you think of the lake, you look at northwest, He's in the way that creek, that arm off of that creek is positioned, it is totally protected. And those fish are probably post-spawn, moving out of the, even farther back than what he is. Even you can see that the creek runs farther than he is, but those fish are probably well along, probably upper 60, maybe lower mm -hmm. 70 degree water. I'll continue from this text. What he's doing shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. He's throwing his jackhammer, which is code for? Chatterbait. Chatterbait, bladed yep. jig, that's right. Yep. And getting bit regularly as for for about 10 pounds, because it gets better as the day warms. I started throwing a bladed jig about four years ago. Well, update is we got four in the box, and only one real good one is about close to five. All the rest are in that two pound class. Bites real slow. All right. See, I wanted to hear that. I mean, yeah. Jamie Hartman's got to now carry the banner for the guys who are a little more seasoned, a little more mature. Is that the nicest way I can put it right there? Yeah. We, we got this youth quake going on out here. <laughs> yeah. We got to have some balance yeah. every now and then, right? The problem with the rookie, it can be a Jamie Hartman that, like you said, is more seasoned, and then you'll have the 20-year-old. It's, it's a, a yep. broad yep. term. That's right. I looked it up. Wheeler, I thought he was 27. He won't be 27 until September. Oh, my gosh. Jeez. Shut up. <laughs> exactly. Sorry. No, no, no. That's that's a good that's time. I got a note involving Steve Bowman and Terry Scroggins. What? Yesterday, Scroggins ran into him at the, at the gas station in the morning and says his knee was hurting. Bowman offered him up his roll of duct tape, which he took, and he wrapped his knee, said it felt better. You know, he's 49th after day one, and he even uh, he wrapped his knee. Was, he walked across the stage with a duct tape around his knee like a brace and then he also used it to patch up his pants his shorts he ripped them with a with a hook so you know what they say about duct tape though if you can't fix it with duct tape you're not using enough duct tape <laughs> okay, okay that's the first time i heard that one makes perfect sense though and, uh, dr Man. bowman dr bowman the and people's he... physician <laughs> Hey, it worked. Uh, hey, don't argue. Uh, 
Yeah, Hartman made a pretty big move in the uh, Rookie of the Year standings yesterday. He was 43 back, and he climbed within uh, 13 of uh, Wiggins. He went over Dustin Cannell, Alton Jr., and Skyler. So he's second now. Second, he's in second. Okay. Well, Jason Christie, he's he's in these these pockets up north on the west side. We've seen him and. The last, you know, we talked about tournaments, the last four tournaments we've had here. Haven't seen anybody fish this area like he's fishing it here, which can be a good thing. Like we mentioned, the lake has gotten a lot of pressure the last few years. And when you, you find a lake that's getting a, a ton of pressure, sometimes you look for places that maybe aren't as good as some of the others, but it gets a whole lot less pressure. And the bottom line is you've only got to catch five a day. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, those creeks, like you say, uh, on the on the west side, getting closer to the dam, certainly play big in the uh, the, the swindle. Uh, yeah, yep. uh, Dean Rojas, classic a few years ago, but but more out, you know, out near the mouths yes. up, way yeah. way different from this. And location. he's farther north. He's on that he is, west yeah, side. He's a little bit farther yeah. north. Yeah, that's he's, right. He's farther north than than we've seen people have success. But 20 years ago, yes, I was fishing 20 year, years ago, like these 26 years old that we're talking about. <laughs> of course, Jacob Wheeler could probably give a seminar when he was six. Oh, sure. <laughs> but there were a lot of tournaments won in this area that Jason Christie's at now. David Wharton, Harold oh, Howard, sure. those guys. Oh, gosh, that, yeah. Hopefully he lets us have it. See the camera. Been around 50 years, Toledo Ben, just a slightly older than Lake Con. Nope. Oh, keep on, keep it on. He does have a little camera. Jason Christie. Looks like not a tournament angle though, just some no. local fishermen out on a beautiful Friday morning. Yeah. Inspiring us all. You bet. All right, Dave, he just got a blog in on KVD. He's got his fourth fish. It wrapped itself around a dock line. There's a picture of him going in to retrieve it. He got it, though. Like Does that surprise you that he's doing docks? No. Last year, he, he caught some of his fish off docks early. Yes, he did. Shad spawn. But then made Up his, against bulkheads and yeah. docks and stuff. Yeah. Made his hay later in the day offshore. And this is... Past the time, you would think somebody would be still up there targeting the shad spawn, but maybe he's found him a few shady docks that are still good. Mid morning. Every time I threw it in there, I. The photo shows it's a very shady area. Probably the key. Yeah, that was a victory last year. Again, the one that started his three victory run in 2016. And there's a little bulkhead dock where he started his day every day. Kevin told me, you know, like I said, I was able to room with him, so I heard a lot of good stuff yeah. just one on one talking. This was probably the hardest elite tournament he ever won. He's won a lot of them. Oh, yeah. But he, I think it was the third day, only landed five fish, and one of them was an eight and a half pounder. He really earned this thing. He was catching them a lot of different ways, but those big fish, the real big ones, came offshore. Yep, this is him in the mornings doing the shad spawn stuff. This one really set him up for for this and that. This, this right <laughs> there, which we saw a little bit of from Jacob Wheeler. And in fact, people are still talking about this day for Kevin Van Dam. Him and Wes Miller talking about yeah, how they had the direct traffic and so forth like that, keep people off the spot. Wheeler worried That's about the same the thing right Van Dam was worried yeah, about. Yeah, yeah. Look at this. The two fish we see Kevin Van Dam catching, 
We were a little later here last year. Yes, we did. So the fish were biting a little better, but if you notice the one we saw Jacob Wheeler catch, the whole bait was outside the mouth. Yes. Both of those fish we've seen Kevin catch so far last year, the footage of him winning, those fish were biting. No, I really wanted to bite. Kevin was probably having to pull out a few I think tricks. he had one, one that he said really choked him. Yep. Compare and contrast it to this right here. Check out where the bait's at. Yep. All it takes is one, one hook right there on the lip. That's all you need. But boy, when you, when you got them hooked up like that and trying to get them in a boat, it, it sure makes you worry that you're going to get them off. They're going to get off. Hey, we talked about Toyota Bassmaster Angler to your points. We can't uh, leave the rookie of the year and the rookie who made the big splash at our first stop of the year. Here at Cherokee Lake, Jesse Wiggins leading that race right now. As Suits informed us, Jamie Hartman. Based on his good work here at Toledo Bend, has jumped all the way up into second place, moving past the likes of Alton Jr., Dustin Connell, Jesse Pacaronte. So, got plenty more coming, lots more numbers to crunch, and hopefully some great pictures. Facts matter. All monofilament is not the same. Berkeley is the strongest, smoothest, most dependable monofilament line in the world. Why would you risk your fishing trip to a line that's made who knows where just to save a buck? Berkeley has been making and perfecting trialing in America for over 75 years. I spool nothing less than the best that's Berkeley trialing, and that is a fact. Champions aren't born, they're created. Every turn of the prop, Every mile on the lake, every cast of the rod, every fish they catch, and every pound they weigh. It builds who they are. It builds a legacy. Now for your 2016 Bassmaster Angler of the Year! Hey, thanks, Dave. Out of office? Oh, man. Hi, right, this is Skeet. Skeet. Out of office? Dude, don't be mad because I thought of it. What? I gotta go. I got someone to the line. Go to teamgtfishing.com to check out my real job. We're supposed to be working. I am working. Is there a place where the underwater images are the clearest you've ever seen? We're seeing every fish, we're seeing every detail of structure, and where every bottom contour was visible, where whatever you wanted to see below the surface was real. Do you want to go? Structure Scan 3D is the future of fishing. We can show you how to find fish faster and catch fish in a way you've never experienced. Let's get them. Is this being in the moment? Is this hanging out? And is this really playing with your kid? Don't stop what you're doing to capture what you're doing. Keep running, keep playing, keep dancing. Just keep doing. GoPro, start recording. You're watching the Bassmaster Elite at Toledo Bend, being brought to you live by PowerPole. Bassmaster Live, got another half hour to go before we take our midday break, and that's our, our bass track look right now at how the scoring's going on. Toledo Bend right now, and Brett Height, second place after day number one, moving into the top spot right there. He's sort of out of our camera range right now. I don't know if he'll be coming into it or not. He's sort of tucked away, way back there, back up the creek. Jamie Hartman, Jacob Wheeler, Fletcher Shryock, and Jason Christie rounding out the top five. We've seen a lot. We've seen some great stuff, as a matter of fact, so far today. Let's take a look at our Power Pole replay of the day. Jacob Wheeler. Jacob Wheeler fishing a DT20, showing you a little trick there with the lift of his rod. It hooks up on a big one. Mm, yeah, look at that. Awesome. <laughs> oh, it's a good one right there. There we go. Just triggering it up, switching to that DC20 right there. 
I just switch up a little bit of profile. There you see it. He even talked about it. Yeah. Which is very unusual. <laughs> Those are little tricks you don't hear guys talk about a whole lot, but Jacob Wheeler put on a seminar for us this morning. Absolutely. Boy, that's like a guy who was confident that uh, he could get it done, and no matter who else knows about it, that's, yeah. that's confidence for you right it there. It really is. It really is. So Jacob Wheeler, who caught one small one, fishing shad spawn up by the uh, launch area, helped his cause a little bit. The thing that's so, so neat to watch, Jacob Wheeler, he doesn't throw one lure over about five casts. Talk about lures now, that's, that brings it, we gotta bring it out, we gotta roll out today's first edition of Yamaha Taste the Bait. Of course, we're gonna focus on Wheeler. And there it is, right there. Okay, the, the crankbait fish we saw him catch was on a Rapala DT-20. I thought I seen He's a shad jump, but. Cranking, cranking that bait with a sure. 5.1. That DT-20 is on the left, maybe, Maybe a little, oh, there it is. It's, a, it's right in the middle, right in the middle. The one with uh, the back straight up, the green back straight up. That's the DT20. He's got a swim bait there. I don't see the hair jig. He caught, caught a couple fish. He lost a real, he lost a real big fish on the hair jig. And then there's a the jigging spoon on the far right, a really big spoon. We saw Brett Chapman win here mm -hmm. on Toledo Bend. Hair jig's also there. And yeah, there's the hair jig from Left to right, the second rod. There you go. There it is. Right there. The old preacher jig. Preacher Seems jig. One good. Another secret there that Seems Jacob down Wheeler down. is told the world. And and exactly what he used it to do too. That yep. was that was the amazing yep. thing. Yep. And then this morning the shad spawn. It was great to watch some buzz bait action. Key thing here, right before he catches this fish, you see another little extra movement with the rod that made that buzz bait flutter and Got that reaction strike. First fish of the morning. And then he gave us a seminar on how to put the clip in. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, not hurt giving me. it all up today. Jacob Wheeler, let's not get off of him. I hope we can pick him up again soon, get some live shots of Jacob Wheeler. There, there you go. You seen him stop and go with the crankbait. Lifted his rod. Getting those fish to react. He plays this fish like a veteran also. At this point, I don't think he's even seen the fish, so you don't know that there's one hook just barely got the fish in the lip. Had he tried to pressure this fish, horse this fish in, we like to call it, mm -hmm. he would have never landed this fish. He was also fortunate, I don't think it ever really jumped. That's the last thing you want them to do is jump when they got the bait Ooh, outside the mouth. Yeah, look at that, awesome. <laughs> oh, it's a good one right there. There we go. Just triggering it up, switching to that DT20 right there. I had to switch up a little bit of profile. Put that one here on the big side. You always love to put that one on the big side. <laughs> this is the oh, a heartbreaker here. Now I think this is the one he Oh, this, oh okay. This is when he landed on the hair jig. Okay, all right. It's it's a really good fish. But with the hair jig, similar to the crankbait. He was reeling that bait fast and killing it, stop and go with the hair jig to be able to trigger those strikes. Letting it go all the way to the bottom, he said. And yep. Jumping it back up. Now that's a really that's nice fish, but. the hair right there. Bigger one on the hair right there. It's a chunky one. It goes on the big side also. Yeah. But in a minute, I hope we see a real big one. Look at this. Oh, that's a dang Watch his rod. Big his rod is doubled. Okay. Got me hung up. Gets him in a tree, which I, we mentioned earlier, there's a lot of timber no. just under the surface of the water here and breaks him off. That was a that one would have went on the real big, big side oh. of the live well. Freaking. Come on. Well, might have been a 10, Ronnie. You got some, speaking of that figure 10, 
Ron Moore has, has been doing a little research on 10 pounders and the Bassmaster Elite Series. One thing's for sure is that 2006 was the first year the actual Elite Series was formed, you know, when we started calling it that. So 2006 was the first year of that, and every single year we have seen a 10 pounder get caught. So yesterday we saw a 910, almost a 10 pounder. Uh, so. Every year we had a 10. Every year we've had a 10 pounder. Going back just the last few years, 2014, a 10 pound, 11 ounce fish by Hank Chariot, Chickamauga. That was the biggest for the year. 2015, we saw a 12 pounder by Chris Zaldane at the California Delta. And then last year, a 10 and a half by Cliff Prince at the St. John's River. So I pitch it to you guys. We missed out on a 10 pounder at Okeechobee. Okeechobee. And even if we count Conroe, we missed a 10 pounder there. We didn't yep. get there. And then will we get one at Toledo or Sam Rayburn, or if there's any other lakes that might do it? You'd think those would be the two. Yeah, I'd think those would be the two. If it doesn't happen here, I think the streak continues at Rayburn. There'll be a 10 pounder called at Rayburn. Rayburn is, is really on fire from, from everything I've heard from locals in that area. And even some of the guys that fished the Bassmaster Classic two weeks ago went over there and fished and said it's awesome. We talk about uh, what's happened recently and way back to the start of the Bassmaster Elite Series. Let's talk about last year. Compare it to this year. There's your figures right there. Hey, they're a little different, but not a lot. Not, mm -hmm. not much. Look it's... at those numbers. This, you know, the 20 pound bags is the most significant change. Only seven this year versus 12 on the first day. But a lot but, of 18, 19s and so yeah. forth like that. So it's, that's maybe a little bit misleading right there. The yeah. poundage not that far off. And more fish caught this year. It's more definitely deeper. not falling off the map. It's still Toledo Bend. Still Will there be a 10? Uh, we got plenty of time to catch a 10 here. Of course, uh, you know, they are catching huge numbers. According to Mark Zona, who did a little snooping around, you know, talking to people about Rayburn, you know, catching, catching big numbers over at Rayburn. We also saw the cut line. What's not in this graphic is the cut line. The top 50, top 51 roughly. Last year was 14 pounds, 11 ounces. This year, 13 pounds, 12 ounces. So cut lines just normally within that one pound that we see, you know, yeah. give or take a day. And the one thing I remember us doing last year that was really cool the state of Texas does such a good job, the Share Lunker program and all that. We, I think it was about 15 or 20 elite fishermen on our day off, went out and released Florida string fing fingerlings. And I know a lot of them don't survive because they have so many predators, but I had two bags of them. I took them so far back in a patch of grass that I think a lot of them will make it and hopefully be one of the 10 pounders we see here. All right. Uh, that uh, one day, uh, six or eight years from now, I remember that picture you holding those two bags ready to release those that way back in the woods. Yeah, that was fun. And I made all the birds get away from there. I spooked all the birds. They were licking their beaks watching me with oh, all those yeah. little fingers. <laughs> yeah, here, here, here comes the snack, the snack truck. Yeah. Davey, I pitch it to you. We just talked about the double-digit fish. How many? Do you remember how many double-digit fish you had in Elite Series competition, and where they were? I remember well, my. We, I remember my two largest. Old one. I don't well, remember. We don't have a. Let's, I just want to hear these other in a boat. A little yeah, bit. no doubt. I can just get one or two bites out of every, every pocket. Jason Christie's running a... Oh, there's got to be some females coming in. I mean, that's my hope. Just come on those females. And, uh, actually, I can come by five of them by the end of the day. Like ants catching if I was... Full. I just cannot. I got distracted and missed uh, Mercer's answer when you asked him if that 910 yesterday from Christie was a, looked like spawned out or pre-spawned. What did he say? Or he couldn't tell. Some of the, you know, in I, there. It was all jacked up like it was post-spawned. Yeah. He, he, 
thought that it was postponed. Okay. It surprised me. He said that more of the fish that were big fish that were weighed looked like postponed. That was surprising to me. Hmm. Even with a mild winter, when we were here, when Prosnick won, we were first week of May, second week of May, just about. First yeah. Week, yeah. One one at spawning, so there's still lots of fish that I'm sure haven't spawned, even with a mild winter. You ask about double digit fish in my career. Yeah. I remember my two largest. You're what, gonna. What I should were they? Remember. Were You're <laughs> looking. It was 11-1 and an 11-2. And those were in elite series competition. Well, one of them might might have been. Before well, we called them elites. It was the the top 150s 100, or 100. 100s, whatever. You know that changed. Where was it at though? I called an 11-1 at Clear Lake in California, and I called 11-2 at Falcon Lake. Two places you would expect to see big fish. For sure. And the two that I have listed here was you caught a 10-2 at St. John's River yep. in 2014. Off the and then bed. I, I believe in 2007 you guys fished Clear Lake yep. for Elite Series competition. And that was the, the the Golden State shootout. And you had a 10 even there. Was it, it 10 even? It was 10 even. Dang, you ruined my story. I know, I'm sorry. I, I got it all the hey, way up you to lost a pound. You lost a pound too right there, Debbie. <laughs> It was, you need to tell Ronnie to back off. See, the, it the is true after years. Bit. California big, excise tax. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Big fish do grow after years now that you said. Man, you have ruined that story. I'm, How many I'm people so have I told 11? <laughs> the one I call it Falcon Lake, I actually caught it on a football mop jig. The one at Clear, and it's heavy line, Falcon Lake. It was a great moment, but the big one at it clear that you now have told the world it was only 10 pounds. I thought it was 11. <laughs> I caught it on a small hard jerk bait with number six trebles. Almost had a heart attack. Oh. I thought there's no way I'm gonna land this video. Yeah. It jumped at the end of the cast. Eight pound test, little number six, but. Did you guys have to have them hooked in the mouth? Remember when Steve Kennedy had to release all those Clear Lake fish? Yes. Giants? Yes. yes. So you caught that one in the mouth yes. too? That's a, that's a feat. Getting oh, all yeah. the trebles in them, that's a feat. Stuff up through here that I feel like a lot of people are probably fishing. I mean, locals and going up there and getting stuff that's a little harder to, a little harder and a little more dangerous to get into. Maybe come across some fresh fish. Service gets a lot better when he gets that's to the outside that's of the box. Boy, it's just, isn't it? That's a great point. He's running these pockets on the northwest part of the lake, which I mentioned gets some, some local pressure, but not a lot yeah. of tournament. I mean, not a lot of man. fishermen are, are uh, in these pockets. Uh, exactly. If he can make that work, he's, he'll yeah. be there on Sunday because he's not going to have a lot of pressure. Yeah. Obviously, that's where he caught his big one yesterday, just doing that thing right there. Back to Jacob Wheeler live. Ooh. Now, Davey, how tough do you think it is running around it's not super low like we've seen in the past but it is two to three feet low and last year when we were there it was high and you could run across the middle if you wanted to now you have to probably stick with those boat lanes you do this is the level that is most dangerous because you have those trees that are just barely under the surface or just above the surface when it's extremely high if you've got a good insurance policy you just run anywhere <laughs> you want eat. to yeah but extremely low is the easiest level to navigate Toledo Bend because only the, the channels are exposed, the trees are out of the water, and you can see, if you don't see it, you're not going to hit it. Unless you're obviously in the very back of a creek. But on the main lake, you can run better when it's extremely low in my opinion. I remember chasing Chris Lane across from the Texas to Louisiana side and he didn't, he disregarded boat lanes and just went. And I told my driver, I said, you better stay in his prop wash because if, if he hits something, 
we can move, but I do not want to try to go another route. Yeah. The problem with trying to follow someone's prop wash, six inches left or six inches right can get you sometimes. Mm. But if it's somebody else's boat, go with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the scary thing, though, not having control. There Jamie Hartman just filled his limit with a three and a half pounder. He's up to about 14 and change, and he's going to climb to the lead here any second on the about unofficial that. standings. Not bad for a guy that told me last night he was just junk fishing, had a no, terrible sure. practice. And there it is. My comment to him was I've won tournaments where I was junk fishing. Sometimes that's just what you do, especially this time of year. Mm. Especially this time of year. Jacob Wheeler's going to do a spinning rod seminar now. Yeah, I'm got sure. something a little different going on. <laughs> Tommy, I got a question for you. Yes, sir. With spinning reels, are you a righty or a lefty? Just like him, right there. C, righty. All my bait casters, all my bait casting reels, I reel with my right hand. When I try to reel, a, because it's just the way you grew up, uh -huh. when I try to use a spinning reel with a right hand retrieve, I look like I don't want to say a rookie because these guys are oh, really yeah. good. But I look like a child. Yeah. I think Jacob's hooked up. Like, you, like you're throwing left-handed. Yep. He's got one. Oh, yeah. Just picked up a total different piece of tackle, equipment, hooked up immediately. I was a little bit bigger than that. <laughs> Got excited, hooked him in the side a little bit, hooked him in the mouth, and just a little keeper, but I think he'll work. He'll measure. Yeah, good to go. <sighs> Number four, man, not a big one, but I'll tell you what, right now, it's all about getting five of them, settling you down, I and mean, then being able to stick with the big guns and go for it. I thought it might have been a little bit better than one. That's incredible. I was hoping it was anyway. He said I don't like to throw the same thing a lot. He just caught one. He picked that spinning rod up and caught one immediately. He, he didn't pick it back up. How do you not make one more cast for that? <laughs> Why do you catch a He's, 10? Oh. You see right there, I'm sorry to interrupt yeah. you, Tom. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. When he hesitated and raised his rod, he's reeling over a, a tree, a, a, a piece of wood, probably a broken off tree or a tree limb. Uh, about, see, right there he did it again. A lot of times that's where fish set up, close to a good contour change and on a tree. I, I caught a seven right there on that exact cast. <laughs> That's why I thought I was like, uh oh. <laughs> In practice, this, you know, fishing around, you know, these fish, you just can't really graph them. They're, these are shallow fish. You just run around and, you know, a lot of these fish are in between. And when I'm, and when I'm saying in between, I mean, you know, eight to 12. And eight to 12 foot's really difficult to graph. When they get out there in 14, 15, you know, 15 to 25, you know, you can see them pretty well and you can catch them. But when they get any shallower than 10, it gets really tough to catch them. And, and I feel like the majority of the bass right now are in that six to 10 foot of water. So, but you gotta really cover a lot of water. You're not, you know, you're visually just, you know, just running down the, it's like almost like running down the bank. You're just running down the bank or you're fishing out in that in-between stuff. And, you know, you never know when you're gonna get a bite. David, we've got a question from a reader. Andy Levine is asking, why does it seem like a lot of the anglers are preferring the western creeks on the west side of the lake? You look at, I'm looking at Bass Track and there's majority on that west side today. Is there a weather, wind related issue with that? It seems to be more protected. A lot of these guys are fishing for spawning fish or, or even the guys that don't seem to be fishing for spawning fish, Jacob Weaver fishing for the post spawn. For whatever reason, they're targeting the ones that are doing it now or have already spawned. And that western side of the lake, it's 
usually going to be protected more from the winds. Those sheltered pockets. We saw that one day at Conroe. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everybody on the lay of the lake Absolutely. is on the west, west side. On the west side. Exactly. In Okeechobee, too. Really? Yep, you're right. Now that I think about Okeechobee, seem to be that way. But it's an early spring thing, or a spring deal where those, those fish tend to move up in those places. Where the well. west side is actually the north side. <laughs> or the east side is actually the north side. <laughs> I still, I, I'm yeah, still reeling Crazy that. there. That's exactly Talking right. about reeling. <laughs> Righty or lefty? <laughs> Direct. Wow, Direct. was that it? Was that a fast three hours? That's three hours. What? What is it? Now it's we 10 o'clock almost. We got to take our hour and a half break coming up here? I hope not. I want to watch Jacob oh Wheeler. My gosh. We'll keep rolling on him if we, we take a break or not. in on something that's coming up here already once this morning. What a day, the final day of the Keiko Bassmaster Classic, but all three days chronicle for you coming up next weekend, Saturday, April 15th, 7 a.m. to 10 a.m. You'll see the first two days of the Classic and we'll have a, a repeat of one of those and the final day of the Classic on Sunday, April 16th, all on ESPN2. Those are all Eastern time. You'll see so much stuff that you didn't get to see on Bassmaster Live, which uh, we were not able to give you live coverage of, uh, uh, well, of our winner right there. And uh, Jordan Lee, we'll have that every bit of his day for you, as much as possible anyway. It is a story that uh, still trying to, every, every trying year, to justify in my mind. Last year with, with Edwin Evers, you'll say, how can we ever have a finish of a classic that would be any more exciting? This year with Jordan Lee, I think it will. Oh, he tops it. He, 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 he set the record for the, for the biggest comeback ever in a, Bass, in a Geico Bassmaster Classic, and it is uh, all for you coming up next weekend. So write it down. Do not miss it. Jamie Hartman of New York leading on to Toledo Bend. Are you kidding me? Red Height. Jacob Wheeler hanging in there as well. Jason Christie doing something all, doing something a little bit different. That's what we like to see. There's the rest of them as they line up there. The Texan Todd Faircloth are leading Texan at this point. Nothing like a buzz bait bite Ooh. early in the morning when you're fishing a Bassmaster Elite Tournament. Yeah, that's better than a sausage biscuit first thing in the 